Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, the Atlantic Council was born uh, almost 60 years ago uh, to support NATO, um, and, uh, and we still have that as so much of our core purpose for reasons I'll outline. I'm Fred Kemp, uh, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, uh, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this important event, NATO at 70, Refocusing for Change. Um, we are so delighted to be co-hosting this in partnership with the NATO Defense College Foundation under Ambassador Alessandro Minuto Rizzo. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to work with you and your fantastic team. Uh, I'd also like to thank our partners at NATO Defense College, represented today by its dean, uh, Stephen Mariano, and National Defense University, represented today by Dr. Richard Hooker, and at MBDA. It's also a great pleasure to see my friend, the Italian ambassador, uh, whenever you come to the Atlantic Council. Uh, uh, it, it is a better place. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, we're also very grateful to Leonardo for their support of the Atlantic Council on this important event. Specifically, I'd like to give a special salute to Bill Lynn, William Lynn, a chief executive officer of Leonardo North America and Atlantic Council board member. I don't believe he's here, but I think that Joe Militano is here. Is that right? Yeah. Joe, it's great to see you here. Uh, uh, Senior VP for Public Affairs and Communications at Leonardo, and, and, th and, and take our best wishes to Bill as well, please. Uh, I'm glad you're all able to join us for what should be a fascinating conversation on the importance of NATO and its ongoing adaptation for challenges of today and tomorrow. In light of the 70th anniversary, today marks an opportunity not only to celebrate NATO's achievements, uh, but also to re readdress fundamental questions about NATO's purpose in today's world and to highlight its enduring mission going forward. Um, it's only relevance that will keep uh, NATO vibrant, uh, and so we really need to talk about what will achieve that. It's also an opportunity to make the case that in today's troubling security environment, a reinvigorated NATO alliance, one with strong U.S. leadership and transatlantic commitment to its mission, is a cornerstone of peace and security in Europe and beyond. Uh, since our founding in 1961, and we were really founded 70 years ago as well, with, there were a series of small clubs that were in support of, uh, of NATO, and uh, with the urging of Secretary of State Dean Rusk in 1961, these clubs came together. Uh, Dean Atchison, and Lucius Clay, Henry Cabot Lodge, Mary Pillsbury Lord, and founded the Atlantic Council to deal with what he considered um, an inflection point in history. Because uh, of the loss of our military, our, our nuclear monopoly, because of, a ch of an ideological challenge and test across the, uh, the, um, uh, the developing world, and because of a Berlin crisis, w which was then on our door, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Rusk said, either you'll come together and I'll work with you, or, or I can't work with you, I can't waste my time. And so Atlantic Council came together at that time. And we come together now at another moment in history uh, that I think is also a defining moment. Uh, and I won't go into depth in this, but it is the context in which we should be talking today. We face uh, a new uh, uh, test of major powers, a, a new major power competition. We face a systemic competition between uh, authoritarian capitalism and democratic uh, free market capitalism. We, we face questions about the future uh, U.S. role in the world and how it will be executed. And we face questions about the very nature of the uh, global system of institutions and practices, uh, whether it is NATO or whether it's the G20 uh, that's taking place uh, in Osaka, Japan, uh, tomorrow and the next day. Um, and with NATO turning 70, we've been doing a great deal of work on NATO-related issues. This past April, on the margins of the NATO Foreign Ministerial and Official State Department-led commemoration in Washington, we hosted our signature NATO Engages Town Hall. And we did it at a rock venue called the Anthem, uh, because we were trying to signal this is a NATO for a new generation and a new period. Um, there, we were joined by foreign ministers of a host of allied nations, as well as Vice President Mike Pence, and a range of experts and next generation leaders, and quite a few next generation leaders, to discuss why, why NATO matter, matters mattered yesterday and matters today and tomorrow. Uh, 
Leading up to and building upon this effort, we also launched a digital media campaign to gather public perspectives and increase awareness about NATO. That kicked off a lively debate with a wider, particularly American audience. We really want to restore and revive uh, 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 support for NATO and understanding for NATO and its relevance today with uh, American voters. And today we look forward to continuing these conversations with all of you gathered here. For those of you in-house and online, I encourage you to join the debate on Twitter by following at Atlantic Council, at AC Scowcroft, and at NATO Foundation. And the hashtag is hashtag NATO at 70. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers that will help us tackle tough questions, and I hope they will be tough questions about the transatlantic state of play and how the alliance must adapt uh, to overcome the evolving threats and challenges we all face. Uh, before we dive in, I'm honored to welcome again Ambassador Alessandro Minuto Rizzo, uh, who will help st set the stage for today's discussions. Uh, the Ambassador is the President of the NATO Defense College Foundation and previously served as Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2001 to 2007. As Deputy Secretary General, he focused strongly on adapting the strategic direction of the NATO Alliance, a fitting mission for today. He worked to expand the alliance and build partnerships throughout Europe and the wider region. He also previously served as Ambassador of Italy to the Western European Union and to the Committee for Policy and Security uh, of, of, of the Euro European Union. He is, uh, he is no stranger to the pressing security issues of Europe uh, and the United States, and he, and, and he is a person who understands the past history and also the present challenges. So it's great to have you here with us. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. It's a great crowd. It's a full room. Uh, and I know this will be a captivating discussion, good conversation, and I hope that will be in no small part because of the questions we get from all of you. So with that, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Minuto Rizzo uh, to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to have in front of me this packed room. Uh, thank you to you for all that. Welcome to this event, Focus on NATO, a special anniversary, the current state of affairs, and the future perspective. I'm really delighted to be here at the Atlantic Council among old and new friends and competent people in order to offer the best possible frame for a good discussion. I wish to warmly thank the Council again for the hospitality and cooperation. A warm welcome, of course, to the speakers, the moderators, and of course to you, to the public here, for having taken the pain to come here in the Washington heat. Roman heat is no better anyway, so no <laughs> nationalistic pretense in any way. Um, we are, uh, why today and why on this subject? is the question, I think. We are all accustomed to anniversaries, but this one seems to be a little bit special for us uh, because the Atlantic Alliance was born in this city in 1949, exactly 70 years ago. I looked at the treaty, it was signed by only 12 countries at the time. Um, the project from the beginning had a very historical dimension to put together North America and Europe what was called the free world at that time in my generation, the most relevant democracies to defend cobalt values against communism and the threat of the Soviet Union. I take a moment only to draw your attention on the ambition of that endeavor because um, the preamble of the treaty says that the alliance is established to promote the stability and well-being of the North Atlantic area and its people. So it's much more than military affairs, if you like. NATO is still here, and now with 29 members, and I think it means something. It has survived successfully through difficult proofs. A Cold War lasting two generations, we have forgotten perhaps too quickly that, Bosnia, Kosovo, 9-11, Afghanistan, just to mention a few important dates. In all those cases, the transatlantic bond worked very successfully. Americans, Canadians, and Europeans acting hand in hand and becoming fully interoperable. 
in all circumstances. That's why some people say this is a very important political military alliance in history. And seven decades of cooperation has proved to me and to many others that the United States and Europe are a, a winning ticket, in fact. After saying that, it is clear the world is changing fast, perhaps too fast, and that we cannot live on past glories anymore. The international environment has become increasingly difficult. More actors of various kinds are emerging, and we have to reflect on the kind of adaptations that become necessary. Fragmentation is dangerous, fragmentation around us and the world. We need security providers more than ever, and some way to have some kind of governance in this world. So we should profit from this occasion. We have two very important panels with fantastic speakers. I repeat what you said, and moderators. The first one will be chaired by the Dean of the NATO Defense College in Rome, Stefan Mariani in front of me, developing issues linked to the present international environment in NATO. And the second panel, moderated by Jan Brzezinski, is going to focus more on possible future strategies. And we have the honor to have Secretary Madeleine Albright to have the concluding remarks. Then a few questions come immediately to mind. What kind of future NATO? How to keep the fundamentals together with change? And then what? A NATO with world partners? Well, perhaps in Asia? How to reconcile strategies with threats? And how, to my mind, is an important point, <coughs> how to keep alive and strong the transatlantic bond. I wish to conclude here thanking all those who made this event possible. In the first place, the Atlantic Council again, with its experience and generosity. Special thanks go from my heart to Philip Morris International, to Leonardo DRS, MBDA, the National Defense University, and the NATO Defense College in Rome and to all those persons who have contributed with their work in Rome and in Washington for the success of what I hope will be a very interesting afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. Everyone, uh, let me add my thanks and welcome to those that you just received. I'm Stephen Mariano. I'm the dean at the NATO Defense College, and it's a pleasure to be here on a winning ticket, uh, which you just heard about. I like that phrase. Um, so, on behalf of the commandant and all the uh, team back in Rome in Chequenyol at the NATO Defense College, I'd like to kick off this first panel. Uh, I just have to say, first of all, the NATO Defense College we're open for business. In a lot of ways, we reflect the tensions of the alliance. We have great discussions uh, there at the college. Uh, with a lot of great visitors as well, uh, and we are uh, tackling them the best we can. Uh, but I also like uh, this idea that, uh, that uh, Fred just mentioned about reaching out to an American audience with uh, conferences and so forth. When I first uh, talked with uh, Ambassador Minito Rizzo and uh, Dr. Politi, it was about the Foundation's reach. And they've done a lot in Italy, uh, but I think this is a great step for the Foundation to find a partner with the Atlantic Council and move forward here in the United States. So the title of this panel is about order and disorder, and uh, almost as if it's a crisis. Uh, and I'm asking myself, isn't there always something in 70 years of NATO's history that's almost a crisis, but maybe not like uh, thus so far? So today we've got four panelists. I'd just like to introduce them briefly, maybe not in the traditional way. Uh, we had a little chat about uh, maybe their fondest memory, since this is an anniversary event, so to speak. Uh, everyone uh, up here has got some experience with NATO and it was kind of fun to hear their reactions. Uh, so of course, uh, Dr. Hooker, who I had the pleasure of succeeding about six years in absentia as the dean of the college, said that was clearly his best memory of NATO was being the dean at the NATO Defense College. Uh, Kathleen said growing up in the UK, which she wouldn't have done had it not been for all those NATO bases in the UK, as, long as, as well as working on the NATO ISAF uh, desk uh, at, in uh, OSD quite a phenomenal time for, for NATO and its operational experience. Uh, uh, Dr. Kordsman said, well, he had actually two. One is he was on the first NATO force planning exercise um, where they did some first real qualitative 
uh, quantitative analysis of uh, force ratios and such. But he, he threw in his worst memory was kind of a failure to get NATO integrated air defense right way back when. Something that's uh, coming back to us, I'd say, uh, possibly today. Maybe we can talk more about that in the future. And, uh, and lastly, Barry, for all you interns out there, this is a good one, is uh, when asked about his fo fondest memory, he said, I was the last Cold War intern at the NATO headquarters. And so he was thrown into a room with Dick Cheney and a bunch of other senior people as an intern. And well, it looks like it turned out all right. <laughs> okay, so with those introductions, you can read more about them, of course, uh, just online. Uh, so let's not waste time with that. Let's get right to uh, the, the, the lineup. And we just ask uh, Barry uh, if you could start off with a few minutes uh, remarks to get us going. Thanks very much. And this is a, a really great event and, and um, I'm personally honored to, to be here and thanks to our partners, uh, uh, as, as Fred mentioned. Uh, I was asked to make se uh, turn disorder into order and so I'm going to make uh, 10 points in seven minutes uh, and then uh, learn from the other panelists. The first five points are sort of my definition of the, the era that we're living in. Future historians will name it and certainly great power competition is one of the major elements, but it's, it's not the only element. And I think if we miss the other four elements, then our strategy and NATO's approach to dealing with it and navigating the world won't be as effective as it, as it should be. And so first and foremost, great power competition. In my opinion, Bob Kagan is right. Uh, the jungle's growing back. Uh, the last 70 years was relatively ahistorical, and we're seeing great powers and other powers start to act geopolitically once again, a bit of fractionation in various regions, a lot of nationalization in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East. And we're going to see a lot more of this. It's a different era than I've ever experienced in my lifetime, even when I was the last Cold War intern. Uh, and so we really need to think about it differently. Second, <coughs> we're at the very beginning of the digital age. It's still going to unfold in, v in many, many ways, fundamentally affecting our society, our economy, our security, and geopolitics. And this is something that great powers will be looking to leverage, both for opportunity, but also there are, there are always dark, darker applications of all the technologies that are unfolding. And, and the one that I'm watching and, and most interested in and most concerned about is biotech in the late 2020s, early 20, 2030s. Third, we're in a new information environment. We produce roughly 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every single day. There's four million Google searches every single minute. But the problem is this data is of highly uncertain quality and integrity. We don't, we, we have to come up with new mechanisms and approaches for authenticating what we're reading, what we're hearing, and now with the advent of deep fake videos, what we're seeing. You, we're gonna see the, the proliferation of, of deep fake videos, artificial videos, uh, in a big way over the next two years uh, a, a, and more. And so our competitors are weaponizing these platforms to, uh, contrary to our interests, and so we need to get a handle on how to, how to, how to address that. Fourth, as Matt Burroughs at the Atlanta Council uh, projected, uh, we're seeing a domestic unraveling within our societies, increasing polarization, increasing disintegration, and, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later. And then last, and perhaps most importantly, is the U.S. global role. We don't know whether uh, the end of the predominant U.S. global role was August 2013 when President Obama chose not to strike 50 targets in Syria, but it may be the case. This is something that we have agency over, so it, it's not final, it's reversible, but we will need to head in a very different direction if we want the U.S. to continue underwriting uh, uh, vast aspects of the global order as it did for, for so many years. So those are the five elements of the order that, that I think we're in, and now sort of five thoughts on, well, what, what can we do about this on a first order basis? Number one, US documents, uh, national security strategy, national defense strategy, have said we're in a great power competition, but they have not yet said what our goals are. So we're in a race, but we don't know where the finish line is in this competition. So the U.S. has to define its goals working with its allies, working with its NATO allies. Ha what, what do we want in terms of an end state relationship with China, with Russia, and how those goals are defined will affect which allies, which alliances are on board with achieving those goals. 
So it's a critically important definition at the beginning of a new era in history. Second, and relatedly, uh, there was a great article by Bob Kaplan uh, last week in the National Interest about dealing with the coming Chinese empire. And his main point was the, U the US better start prioritizing. We can't do everything. And he said China would like nothing more than for us to get involved in more messy wars in the Middle East. So with limited resources, the US, US strategists, NATO strategists need to think about where do we apply our resources? How do we do so in smart ways? Because we cannot get involved uh, everywhere again. Third, we need to get our own houses in order. We need to address the domestic unraveling. We need to re come together again, be more coherent, have functional polities, uh, and, and really uh, get our act together at home. Fourth, very importantly, there's a critical geopolitical need for strengthening our alliances. And this has to do with picking our battles. In, in my opinion, the United States is going to need NATO very, very badly within the next five to, to eight years. It's going to need uh, Asian alliances very badly. We need to start building those, strengthening those at all levels from head of state down to, uh, to, to, to the, the, the many operators and, and other people that are part of the alliances. And then lastly, fifth, uh, we need to stop regionalizing. In other words, China is in Europe in many ways. Russia is in the Pacific in many ways. And we almost had a, a near crisis with our ships almost colliding a couple of weeks ago. So we need to get over our, our nice, comfortable Cold War regional boundaries. Uh, and, and get past it with a, a couple of thoughts I have. We need to get NATO allies from North America and Europe together with Asian allies and maybe add India. We need to start coordinating. We need to start talking on a routine basis, start consulting, because we're, we're like-minded and we're facing the same challenges really all over the world. And then my last recommendation is uh, NATO should uh, offer a NATO-China council to, to China. At this point, China wouldn't take the offer. But just making that offer, I think, will have beneficial effects. And it's going to happen at some point. Uh, so we might as well get started, because the top of the agenda that I've seen in many discussions with our European colleagues is China, as well as the other issues we'll hear about today. So uh, that's the end of my 10 recommendations and turn it over to the others. Thanks. Nicely done. Thank you very much. Let's continue on. Kathleen, your task was to talk about from conventional and nuclear threats to uh, hybrid and cyber threats. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, for having me here. And um, it's, it's truly a delight to, to be able to join this distinguished panel and, and, and interact with all of you about these key issues. Um, I should state at the outset that my day job is at the Congressional Research Service, and so anything that I say today is my view only. I'm here in my personal capacity. My views are not representative of the United States government, CRS, et cetera, et cetera. So with that caveat aside, um, it's after lunch. I'm hoping to be a little bit provocative with uh, my thoughts to for, uh, for you today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here to, s I've been asked to speak to on the topic of from conventional and nuclear to hybrid and cyber. and that topic implies that there has been a shift in, region, in recent years from, from an old strategic construct to a new one. Um, and underpinning all of this is a central thesis which has been expressed in the national security strategy as well as the national defense strategy that we are witnessing the erosion of, of world order, the world order that was established in the wake of World War II. And this erosion of the rules and norms have, has led to significant implications for the future of international relations and the NATO alliance itself. But what if we're, we put on a different prism on, the, on this strategic challenge or the strategic landscape? And what if we're instead not witnessing an erosion per se? What if we're witnessing something slightly different? And what if that something different is something like our adversaries are instead of eroding them per se, they're, they're using our institutions and our norms and our values against us in ways that we hadn't necessarily envisioned? towards their own authoritarian agendas. In other words, what if our adversaries are using our international and domestic institutional hardware, but running, trying to run new software on that, right? And if that's true, then, then how are we seeing this play out? Ch um, China, for example, seems to be uh, translating its growing economic influence into growing geopolitical power. And 
recipients of Belt and Road Initiative funding are beginning to uh, de-recognize Taiwan as a state and instead um, recognizing China as you know, one China policy. And of course, international recognition by other sovereign states is a foundational element of what we consider to be a modern nation state. Another example, China is trying to use international bodies such as the International Technical Com or Telecommunications Union to promote its own standards of cyber governance. Um, as the Atlantic wrote, um, they're trying to create the quote, the first competitive alternative to open internet, a model that is they're steadily proliferating around the world. Another possible example, uh, China's established a UN peacekeeping academy an institution uh, within China, which is increasing its understanding of and access to foreign militaries. And, and finally, China is using our own arguments that we deployed uh, during the global war on terrorism to justify its oppression of Uyghur communities and their replacement of those communities into re-education camps, using different software on our hardware. Turning to Russia, Russia also appears to be using our democratic values and norms of free speech against us. Um, Peter Singer tells us about like wars and how Russian online trolls are finding and exploiting existing themes in our publics. And in some instances, they're creating those themes that we've been seeing with the anti-vaxxer debate. They've been exploiting disinformation and local dissent to create pretexts for little green men. They're running new software on our hardware. So what does all of this mean for NATO? What do, we, what do we do when we, we're confronted by political warfare or comprehensive co coercion, um, to, which are terms used to describe uh, the use of a variety of instruments of national power, including our in own insti institutions, and, uh, internationally and domestic, to advance their objectives short of warfare itself? And in this, going back to the beginning, uh, the past may be instructive. Um, Article two of the 1949 Washington Treaty states, quote, the parties will contribute towards the, f the, future de uh, the further development of peaceful and friendly international relations by strengthening their free institutions, by bringing about a better understanding of the principles upon which these institutions are founded, and by promoting conditions of stability and well-being. They will seek to eliminate conflict in their international economic policies and will encourage economic collaboration between any or all of them. So we talk a lot about NATO's Articles 3, 4, and 5, and we tend to think of NATO as a military alliance. Indeed, this is one of the, you know, we mentioned Afghanistan. This is one of the predominant philosophies, again, um, that, that got us into the comprehensive approach. The NATO military does the defense stuff, and the other institutions do all the rest of it. But looking at Article 2, you know, we can't, I can't help but be struck that our predecessors thought about these issues in a much more holistic way. To them, the military was necessary, but certainly not sufficient to win the emerging strategic competition with the Soviet Union. And looking to today, one can't help but wonder whether NATO is missing out on a critical role it could play in fostering Article II collaboration, collaboration amongst treaty allies. So in conclusion, if you agree with this analysis, and you may not, um, but a number of questions kind of start to flow. You know, how do we counter our international institutional hardware being taken over by malware by other actors? How do we build a common understanding between our business, trade, and national security communications about the security challenges at hand and their implications? And, and might NATO itself play a role in fostering those uh, conversations and strategies? And returning to the question at hand, has there been a shift from conventional and, and nuclear to hybrid and cyber? Or has it always been all, all at once, but in different degrees? And finally, what can we learn from the blueprint that our forebears laid out for us? I think there's a lot there. It'd be interesting to get into it. I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, excellent. Um, let's uh, go to Dr. Rich Hooker, uh, who's got a, a task to talk about uh, a two-track approach with Russia, so a good tee up by Kathleen. So Rich, over to you. So well, I thought I was gonna talk about deterrence and defense and then the two-track, but. Yes, sir. Great, I'd like to do that. First thing I'd like to address uh, sort of head on is the common view that one finds in the Pentagon, the State Department, maybe the West Wing, certainly in London and Paris and, and Brussels and Berlin, uh, which is that, that the probability of conflict with the Russian Federation on NATO territory is very, very low. I would describe this as the conventional wisdom. Uh, I, I personally, and this is a personal opinion and everything I say is, it's not, it's not, it's not the DOD line as I think you'll appreciate, it's, it's Richard Hooker's line. I'm not at all so sure that that's, that's correct. 
Um, if you go to the website of the Russian president, you'll find a speech that Vladimir Putin gave to the ambassadors and perm reps of the CIS in 2014, just after the Ukraine crisis erupted, where he says, let me be clear, we will defend our brothers abroad with all available, all available means. The following year, in 2015, the state prosecutor almost certainly had Putin's direction formally challenged the legality of the State Council's decision in the early 90s to recognize the independence of the Baltic states. If you look at what Putin tells the Duma, if you look at what his closest advisors have told us in the West, and if you look at the transcripts of any number of our track two interactions or engagements, or track one and a half engagements, where former diplomats, former military officers meet with Russian counterparts, they get a unified, a unified line that comes back, uh, almost certainly originating with the, the Russian government. And that line is, uh, number one, you better not think about in any way strengthening your defensive or deterrent posture in, in NATO's eastern flank, so the Baltic region, Romania, Bulgaria. Don't even think about it, because we're going to react very, very strongly if you do. Now, what accounts for all of this? I think there are about four factors that we ought to consider. The, the first is that uh, I think scholarship generally agrees that the, that the one thing that Putin fears and detests more than any other is the presence of color revolutions, successful, economically viable, Western integrated, democratic countries on his doorstep. Uh, even more so in, in, in the former Soviet territory. Well, he's got three of those, or more, right on his periphery, right on his borders with, uh, with Poland and with the uh, Baltic states, and perhaps with some of the others. Uh, number two, we know from a cursory study of Russian history that the question of strategic depth has always engaged Russian leaders and Russian military planners. After the experiences of the invasion of Charles XII, um, the, any number of conflicts with, uh, with Poland, with Napoleon, with the Germans, this question of strategic depth absorbs the Russians. And they lost a lot of strategic depth with the collapse of the Soviet Union. As Newt Gingrich pointed out during the, during the 2016 campaign, Estonia and NATO territory, therefore, is virtually a suburb of St. Petersburg right now. Um, Putin talks often about this narrative of Russian greatness. This, not only this desire, but this need, the rightfulness of restoring Russia to its former place of greatness on the world stage. And the reincorporation or the re-extension of influence over these former Russian territories is a big part of that narrative. And finally, I think we all know that um, if there was a, a reasonably low-cost way to fracture NATO, Putin would certainly take advantage of that. So this would, be, this would be my analysis right there. Personally, I put the chances of Russian aggression on NATO territory, probably in the Baltic region, in the next five or 10 years, at one-third to one-half. Not very low probability or non-existent. Although I say up front, that's not the conventional wisdom in this town. And nothing would make me happier if I were wrong and all the other experts are right. But I'm not so sure. So if all this is true, then what is the state of NATO's deterrence right now? Where well, I would pose three questions. The first is, would Putin be deterred by the, um, by the possibility that NATO or the nuclear members of NATO would use nuclear weapons in defense of NATO territory? I don't find many experts out there that think that think that we would use or even threaten the use of nuclear weapons to defend Estonia, for example. So I don't think that he's dissuaded by, by that. Let's talk about our ability, the alliance's ability to defend within place forces. Every major think tank in Washington and, and every other major think tank that I'm aware of that's looked at the issue basically arrives at the same conclusion, which is that the places that are in being right now on the eastern flank are not sufficient to defend even for a limited period of time. So that prop of deterrence goes out the window. What about the potential for NATO to mobilize and at least retake 
to any territory that, that Russia might, uh, might grab. Well, there again, NATO readiness across the board is not a, it's not a good news story. The French, the Germans, the British, all would take a minimum of three or four months, we read, to put even a single division um, into place to participate in that campaign. The United States has got very limited forces in place, a small airborne brigade in Italy, a striker brigade in Germany, far from the scene of the action, um, and a heavy brigade in, in Poland. So uh, the ability for NATO to do something meaningful, even in a three or four or five month time frame right now, is, is not good. NATO readiness across the board is in, is in, is in real trouble. The 30-30-30 initiative that was rooted last year at the uh, defense ministerial meeting, I think is a great, great step in the right direction. The ministers agreed to it in principle, those fateful NATO words. I, I, uh, I hope and trust that it will all come to pass, but we will see about that. But if we're concerned about the, the state of deterrence today in the alliance with respect to the Russian Federation, at least in that part of NATO, I think, I think we have to conclude that um, it's parlous at best and there's a lot of work that, that has to be done. I'm not going to talk about Russian capabilities because they're well known to this audience and I don't think that's really in question. Russia's ability to project its military power far from its borders is not good. Russia's ability to carry out military operations along its periphery, uh, certainly in, in Eastern Europe, is actually quite formidable. And I'll leave it at that and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Rich. Dr. Kortzman, you, your task was uh, to introduce us a little bit to the 2% debate and give us your own analysis. You know, first let me say that having come to NATO in 1961, uh, I missed the order. So I'm glad to know that it existed before 1961, <laughs> but sure as hell didn't work at any point after that. But more seriously, I think we are trapped to some extent today in a burden-sharing debate and in goals which not only make no sense but are actively destructive and mathematically absurd. And the goals I refer to are 2% of GDP and 20% on equipment. If you actually look at these goals on a country-by-country -country basis, they are remarkably counterproductive. They also ignore a key aspect of what we actually say about Russia. There's no public figure that the U.S. issues anymore as to what Russian military expenditures are. But I think most people in the U.S. intelligence community would probably agree with the IISS it's officially somewhere around 62 billion a year and probably in purchasing power somewhere closer to 68. Now we're having a massive debate over burden sharing but if you look at the NATO report the Secretary General issued in his 2018 posture statement, NATO Europe alone is spending about $282 billion a year. That's 4.5 times NATO. If you remember that Finland and Sweden to some extent contribute on the northern flank, that ratio is much higher. If we throw the United States into the equation, NATO for some reason doesn't believe we have nuclear weapons and doesn't believe in outlays, so its figures are about, oh, $85 billion lower than our actual defense budget. But even if we use the NATO figures and we add the U.S. and Europe, we're spending something like 14 times what Russia and Belarus spend. And the question immediately arises. Either all of our estimates are totally wrong on the spending and intelligence side, or we have a problem that has very little to do with massive increases in expenditure. Pick up the Secretary General's report. It's kind of amazing. We're supposed to have run way down on spending since 1989. Actually, 
we're pretty close today to what we spent in 1989 in constant dollars. It's in the Secretary General's report. The breakup of the Soviet Union has reduced Russian spending to about half or less of what it was at the time this began. So we then go on to the idea of what does 2% buy? Well, if you look at the spreadsheets, you find out that more than half the countries in the central region are not only not close to 2%, even if they started spending today, they couldn't possibly sustain their force postures even at 2%, much less make the kind of additional expenditure they really need. But what is rather impressive is that if you look at the IISS at a different metric, which is how much have countries actually increased their expenditures over the last four years, the answer is a lot. Not enough, but it is not in any sense been negative. And what happens when you do spend more than 2%? Well, let's take a look not at Germany, which tends to get, shall we say, a little more criticism than it may deserve. Let's take a look at Great Britain, which is spending 2.2%. Well, gee, uh, hmm. if we look at the army, it's gone totally hollow. You got about 227 tanks that are active now versus 870 at the end of the Cold War. We look at the Royal Air Force. It's at about 38% of its strength in 1989. And we look at the British Navy, and it depends on whether you like ships or tonnage, but you're at about half. So it doesn't matter whether you get to 2%. It doesn't do a damn thing. So what about NATO and burden sharing? Well, one thing I find actively embarrassing as an American, and if I were a European, I would have some rather pithy things to say about it, is NATO is forced to put the 70% of expenditure figure into the Secretary's statement and to count US defense spending as if our entire budget somehow contributed to NATO. So where do we stand? We've got ongoing wars and we have the lowest active manning that we have had since 1957 deployed overseas. What is the percentage of our manpower that goes to NATO as part of the total force? What is deployed in all of Europe, including non-NATO countries, is less than 5%. If that strikes you as a mortal burden on America and a critical reason to disengage from the Atlantic Alliance, uh, you may have a real problem with math. <laughs> now, about the 20%, there has to be somebody in the international staff that has one hell of a sense of humor. Because if you look at the Secretary General's report, what is the most successful equipment spender in the alliance? It's Luxembourg. It is spending more on equipment than any other state. So what we need, obviously, is more military bands. <laughs> but if you look at what countries are spending on over time, you don't see any move toward interoperability. You don't see any standardization of fleet modernization in virtually every technical area, particularly in the areas that were just mentioned, which are on the edge of Russia, you see absolutely no coherence in dealing with force modernization in ways which make effective use of the resources. And you can actually see this pretty well documented by looking at the force numbers in the annual edition of the military balance. What do we need to do? Well, you have to have clear priorities and they have to cut across countries. Let me say, why did NATO force planning collapse in the 1960s? One was that the United States started lying about its contribution to the alliance because of Vietnam. 
So when we couldn't tell the truth, we couldn't demand anybody else did. The other is we never actually allowed serious debate about what individual countries were doing right and wrong. We accepted what they said, we went ahead, and the ministerial decisions were irrelevant because they didn't affect any aspect of meaningful strategic planning. What do you need? You need a realistic assessment of the threat, a net assessment. You need effective force planning. You need an honest effort to force countries to coordinate and use their resources together. And above all, on America's part, you need to stop this mindless bullying exercise in burden sharing and get down to the core values of building up a meaningful alliance. Well, thank you very much. I think we're in good time. Uh, I'd like to pose a couple of questions before we open it up to the audience. Uh, and uh, first, for, for Barry Pavel, uh, I, you know, I found the two things you mentioned there at the end quite, quite fascinating. One is uh, for NATO to start dialoguing with Asian allies. Um, it seems like we've tried that before, mid-2000s, mid I call Secretary General going to Japan. So what would be different about, about this time? What would, what, what would be qualitatively different or procedurally different? We know NATO's got its own kind of uh, bureaucracy, and, and it would be a similar question about a NATO-China council. How would, how would that play out? I, the act of offering it would be obviously powerful, but what would some of the, the, the potential implications or obstacles be inside a NATO? Sh sure, on the, on the first issue of uh, getting you know, NATO allies, uh, Asian allies, and maybe India, you know, speaking, consulting together more systematically and routinely is this, th the reason that would work better now than before is there's a, it's a completely different circumstance. There's a reason now. Uh, as I said, China's at the top of the agenda of every European security official that I speak to. It's not a military threat right now, but that's coming in the 20, in the 2020s where you're seeing bases now in Africa, you know, and, and other access in the Mediterranean. They were part of the Russian exercise last year. It's coming. And so, um, you know, who knows China better in terms of the broader strategic challenge as, as well as the military uh, challenge than, than Japan, who has the sort of uh, neighborhood intel you know, I, I think consulting about, about that, because, and the reason it'll work better than before is, you know, it's, it's getting, kind of, getting kind of serious. Um, and then um, regarding a NATO-China council, I think there's a, there's a lot to start to talk about. You could argue, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll an EU-China discussion, which, which basically happens, is, is, um, is more appropriate. But I think, uh, again, with the growth of Chinese uh, military and security activity, uh, increasingly in Europe or Europe's neighborhood, it makes a lot of sense to start talking, understanding each other. How do you think about deterrence? Uh, maybe there's some common challenges that could be discussed. So in some ways, very similar uh, dynamics as the NATO-Russia Council, but in a very different set of circumstances. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, I wanted to ask uh, your, your comment about the uh, uh, new software running on, on old hardware. Um, and and but political warfare, which was kind of the upshot there, it's been around for a long time. So, so what's different now about this type of political warfare that, that you're describing? Is it, is it, uh, is it the means with the, that are being used, or is it the motivation for the politics? Um, I mean, I think, you know, reading back and um, like NSC 68, lo looking at the Treaty of Washington, all those sorts of things, it doesn't actually strike me that there's too much that's fundamentally new here, right? But there's there's speed issues. There's there's different means. You know, the as as Barry discussed, the the cyber domain, um, if you want to call it that, that is contributing to the the, the speed, the, the simultaneity of which with which we can we have to grapple with these challenges. But ultimately, you know, this stuff isn't new, right? What what seems to be different now is our own bureaucratic and strategic approaches to these things. We, we, we stovepipe our answers and responses, and we think about things in military terms or business terms or trade terms. And, it's, and these, these communities 
it's like ships passing in the night because there's different strategic assumptions. Getting to that conversation, getting to a common starting point would be, just, just that alone I think would be enormously valuable in helping us figure out what are the contours of this, this version of political warfare or comprehensive coercion or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and recognizing, and again, why, why might NATO have a role in this? And building off of Barry's point, that China is very active in Europe, right? Technology acquisition, BRI, you know, and we're seeing China use those tools as, as leverage points to, to accomplish their own political objectives within the EU and within NATO. These are, these have traditional, traditionally, within recent years, our, our different respective communities have thought about these problems in terms of, again, business, trade, security. But these are interrelated issues, and, and, and we don't seem to have a grammar yet to, to, to talk about these things with each other. So let's start building that, or we don't have a common starting point. Let's do that and then start figuring it out from there. Because I think we'll find that, again, a lot of the, the solutions that we devi devised in the past are going to be pretty applicable to the future. Excellent. Thank you. Rich, I wanted to come to you on the points about uh, your, that you, you raised about the implications for alliance cohesion. I mean, there's a lot of debate inside the alliance about those kinds of, of issues. Um, wh what do you think it'll take to, to build the cohesion that the alliance used to have uh, or, or appeared to have, despite some, uh, <laughs> some comments uh, from 1961? Well, you know, you, I guess you, you start by observing that the real center of gravity of the alliance is its cohesion, and its cohesion is, in, in a way, being challenged by, by all these different things that we've talked about. It's being challenged by Brexit. It's being challenged by mass migration. It's being challenged by the, the enduring financial fragility of some of the member states anyway. It's being challenged by trade wars. It's being challenged by a real, real threat, I argue, from the Russian Federation and a number of other issues. So um, you, you hate to say that it's going to take a war to bring NATO together. Uh, if, there was a, if there was a virtue to the Cold War, it, it had a unifying influence that we all remember those of us that are old enough to remember, um, there, there really wasn't a, a lack of consensus on, on the threat. Um, you, you often hear that, that, uh, that NATO allies have never pulled their weight. Well, the German army in 1980, if I'm not mistaken, had 12 divisions, bigger than the U.S. Army today. The U.K. in the 50s was paying 12 or 13 percent of GDP <laughs> on defense. I could go on and on and on. Um, I mean, I think we had a pretty unified alliance there. Not that it didn't have lots of shocks, right? So the Suez was a shock. Hungary in 56 was a shock. Czechoslovakia in 68 was a shock. Vietnam was a huge shock. Um, being asked to leave Paris was a shock. So NATO has always had to deal with these internal challenges. That's part of its history. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, overstate the challenges that we face today. You hope that we don't have to face a real existential crisis to get back to the kind of, of consensus that we once enjoyed, but it, but it may take that. Political will is really the sticking point when it comes to most of these tough challenges. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Korsman, I want to just ask about, is there some other metric then? If 2 percent is um, a, a, and 20 percent are not realistic or you're having good fun with them and the international staffs uh, or the section speechwriters. Um, is there some other metric that, that you would suggest or that's been discussed maybe previously that was discarded or that can come back around now as a, a way of, of uh, talking about uh, burden sharing in a different way besides a, a 2 percent? I think the fact is that burden sharing is always going to be debatable. I'm fascinated at the idea of this consensus of NATO because the force planning exercise broke up in the mid-60s because the European allies did not want to fund conventional options at the expense of forward defense based on nuclear weapons. It broke up because we had to draw down massive amounts of our capability for Vietnam. And it was followed by, shall we say, one damn thing after another. Uh, in 1960, you mentioned the period of stability before then. Everybody's forgotten just how brutal it was to have the U.S. phase out 
virtually all of the equipment that was being provided to Europe and have European allies take over the purchase of the equipment. I see some people here who might be familiar with those aid programs. But the fact is you don't base an assessment of an alliance on spending levels unless you tie those spending levels to military capabilities and to some aspects of deterrence and war fighting. If you provide truly arbitrary goals, what you don't understand is it actually does the alliance a fairly serious amount of damage if countries go for 2% without moving toward interoperability and changing their force structure. The 20% goal is even worse. There's a scatter diagram in the Secretary General's report, and if you look at it clearly, the countries moving toward 20% are so out of line with the ones spending enough that you are actually watching a period of serious distortion in the way countries are funding their forces. But why on earth, given the level of Russian spending in our spending, are the goals dollars, and why on earth should anybody take the U.S. seriously on 70 percent? I don't know. I, it may be I see Hans and uh, my old friend over here. Here, you may remember Nunn and Warner actually asking what the U.S. really spent on NATO at the height of the Cold War, and they put it in to legislation. And the figure was 27 percent. And we pushed to have 70 inside the Secretary General's annual report. Now, there is a certain element of obvious dishonesty there. And one thing you can say, one thing you don't do when you set force goals is lie. Thank you. Last one for me before we open it up. And it's what is terrorism have to do with any of your arguments? Is terrorism part of the unraveling of the order? Is, where did it show up, Kathleen, in your discussion about threats and what's it going to do to the alliance? Uh, how about the money that's the, uh, the NATO spending? What if uh, nations come forward and say, well, this is all my domestic security spending? How does that calculate? Is that a new metric? And Rich, what does that have to do with anything about defense and deterrence? How, do you, how does the alliance get on board with the deterrence against terrorism? Let's just say, for example, that that becomes a new priority threat for NATO. Barry, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think terrorism is going to um, be significant again. I mean, it's, it's almost certain sometime over the next 10 years there will be a significant uh, terrorist attack somewhere, somehow. Um, but so, so we, there's, a, there's a number of very important things that all allies need to continue to do. I think we're uh, cooperating very, very well on counterterrorism, on intelligence, on operations, uh, et cetera, working across our, our inner agencies. So we got to keep doing it, but you got to set priorities somehow. And when you have an active, you, when you have two active nation state adversaries collaborating to rip our alliances apart and destroy our domestic polities, kind of focuses the mind a little bit. So I'm not saying that you can ignore terrorism. We should keep up the efforts, but you have to set uh, serious priorities. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, uh, I guess we need a NATO and, and associated security institutions that can walk and chew gum at the same time, right? We need to be able to look at this great power competition that's occurring but also be, ha be able to help nations develop the tools to be resilient to those attacks, and also to be able to develop, develop common coherent strategies to, uh, towards contending with them. You know, NATO is a 360 organization now. And, and so, th yes, it's going, is it going to be a strategic challenge? Is, are we going to be, is it, is it gonna be difficult to keep us focused on the priorities when, when terrorist attacks you know, may continue to try to pull us back into that world? Yes, but again, this is a vibrant institution that's lasted 70 years, and as we've discussed, it's gone through any number of crises. We can manage this, too. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Excellent. Um, Rich. Yeah, I, I think Barry has it ab about right. If the, if the essence of, of NATO is collective security, I think counterterrorism more often falls 
um, in, in, into the national basket. Of course, there's high priority on intelligence sharing and those kinds of things. What we've seen over the last 20 years is a disinclination for most on the part of most of the allies to join with us to go to the Middle East and target these groups. A very, very different approach, of course, when there is a terrorist incident that happens inside the borders of a NATO country. But the role of NATO as an alliance, for example, um, to contribute or, or to come inside the borders of, let's say, France uh, to do something about it, that, that's just really not what NATO's core mission um, is. Uh, I think NATO can provide uh, uh, a framework for the kind of information and intelligence sharing, best practices, training, those kinds of things that perhaps can contribute to the counterterrorism or anti-terrorism mission. But I agree with Barry, I don't see it as a high priority. I see it as more of a national priority. Excellent, thank you. Sir. First, I think it's a very narrow line between little green men and terrorism. And if you are talking about that type of asymmetric war, in many ways it is the kind of threat that requires you to do exactly what has just been said. The other thing is I just probably trot something out from the history of NATO which has pretty well been forgotten. In the early 70s, 1972 to 1973, we had to completely restructure the storage of theater nuclear weapons in Europe because of the fear of a relatively tiny handful of extremist groups like Bader Meinhof. So you have no sort of inherent historical immunity here. Having worked on the project, I'm not sure I felt the threat was that real, but when I saw how the nuclear weapons were stored, I thought it was still a pretty good idea. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. At this time, we'd like to open the floor uh, for your questions. Just ask you to identify yourself and uh, affiliation if you care to share one. So we've got a hand right here, please. And microphones coming from the side. And if you could stand as well, uh, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Piotr. I'm uh, from SAIS. Um, and uh, I guess you could say a byproduct of, of when uh, Western and Russian relations succeed. Um, so my question really relates to um, the idea of, I was here last week and I asked a similar question to the panel about uh, Russian interference in Venezuela and the response I got was frankly non-existent, they just dodged the question. So I'd like to try and ask it perhaps better phrase this time, but um, what is it NATO can do specifically to, uh, to improve uh, the relationship with Russia? Because I think uh, when we talk about Russia, the rhetoric quickly goes from referring it to as Russia to Putin. And I think there's a big distinction between Putinism and Russia, which, uh, which once he goes, which I, I look forward to, uh, there might be an opportunity for, for constructive discourse. So um, what is it NATO can do to, uh, to try and you know, work with Russia closer in the longer run to, uh, to mitigate concerns and counterterrorism and transnational issues? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. You want to just start here, Rich? I mean, Clint, try to reset. Bush 43, try to reset. Obama tried to reset. President Trump has reached out any number of times to Putin, trying to find the common ground that we can build a better relationship upon. My personal opinion is Putin doesn't see it as in his interest or Russia's interest to foster improved relations with the West or with the United States. It doesn't fit his narrative. It doesn't help him domestically, politically at home. Um, he gets a lot of benefits, I think, from his perspective. Um, in contending with the United States because he is seen on the world stage to be contending as an equal, which is something that's important to him. I don't know how many times and in how many different ways we can say or try over how many different years uh, that we want to reach out and improve this relationship. Personally, I just don't see a lot of potential right now with this guy in charge of that country. Uh, Kathleen, and then we'll come back. Um, it's a sort of separate but related point. Uh, your, your question was framed in terms of Russian intervention in, in, in activities in Venezuela. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm, and I'm going to go on that point for a hot second. Um, and it speaks to Barry's point, right? We as the NATO alliance, we've thought about European security as, as its own separate sphere. And 
geopolitical realities are suggesting that actually we can't continue to do so, that these, these, these threats are global, that, that actors are competing with us in spheres that we're not traditionally used to thinking about in terms of strategic competition. And so it's going to have impacts for how NATO develops its strategy, how, how it thinks about its plans, and, and what the role of the United States and allies within you know, th this construct, how we're going to be grappling with this, this strategic environment. Yeah. Oh, two responses. I mean, I like the question because if you're looking at the long-term challenge from China, which is, a, which is a competitor that the United States has never dealt with before, the strategic thing to do would be to, if it's possible, to try to peel Russia off of that, uh, that uh, partnership uh, so that we can deal with China from a, on a stronger basis. You know, in some ways, uh, analogous to the opening to China that Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon engineered in 1973. Um, is that feasible, though, <laughs> and how do you do that? I think those are really uh, um, important questions. The second point I would make is there are some scholars arguing that there's now a Eura Eurasian continent identity, or a growing one. Bruno Massais in his, um, in his work and his writings. And I think that is a, um, you know, another form of the challenge that we see where uh, the theory is that China, Russia, you know, all, all major actors on the U Eurasian continent are beginning to form an identity partly drawn to the Belt and Road, et cetera. And, and that, that's another sort of prism on the challenge we face. And so if we could peel Russia off um, to deal with a bigger challenger in some ways, that would be, that would be fortuitous. Excellent. Sir. Just very briefly, I'm not sure I see that much difference between Venezuela and Syria, except Syria is a lot closer to NATO. And when you watch Russia expand its arms transfers back into Egypt, and you see issues like S-400 sales to Turkey, when you see a place like Qatar basically using the S-400 as a way of pressuring the US to help it out against the UAE and Saudi Arabia, this is exactly an interactive game that goes a lot further than the traditional area of NATO operations. Thank you. Uh, some more questions. I thought there was a hand uh, here. No, okay, I see one back there. Weekly up, see him high. There you go, thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Morgan. Um, I'm from uh, GW's Elliott School. And I'm just uh, wondering if you guys can comment on uh, Turkey's long-term role within NATO and where you guys see it going within the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you. This one's going to be fun, I think. Um, Kathleen, you want to start down there? OK. <laughs> no. Oh, Anthony, please. I think one answer to your question is today, so much depends on the future of Erdogan. This is not so much Turkey as one particular political figure leading a somewhat uncertain political structure, particularly after losing virtually every major city in the country. And will he emerge as more authoritarian? Will he be checked by some of the changes in Turkish politics? The answer is we don't know, but I think what's very active is you're watching Russia attempt to exploit the situation. You're watching the fact that not every member of the alliance is going to see its highest priorities as being the alliance, or certainly not every leader is. And we have to get used to that because, frankly, as part of this whole asymmetric structure we face, we can pretty well count on Russia finding every fault line it can we can count on people who want to lever us exploiting those fault lines by reaching out to places like Russia or simply dealing with their own internal structures. If anybody thought we were evolving toward some form of globalism, and I always thought the word was something of a practical joke, uh, we aren't. Rich. So in the spring of 2017, when H.R. McMaster asked me to join his merry band and work in the Europe-Russia office, I, I little thought that I would be spending 
every bit of 40% of my time on Turkey. Turkey's a real, is a real challenge. It's a real challenge. It's a big, powerful, important member of NATO. It's an unhappy ally right now. We've got real fault lines in the bilateral relationship with Turkey. Some of them um, originate with us and some of the strategic decisions that we made. We don't have to belabor those. Some of them are not. Some of them have to do with um, the direction that democracy has taken in, in Turkey. A lot of it has to do with uh, outreach to the Russians and the S-400 issue in particular, which puts us on the horns of a dilemma because we have re legislation that requires us to sanction a NATO ally, a powerful NATO ally, um, over that arms sale. Um, there is a level of distrust, I would say, loss of confidence on, on all sides. So the question uh, of Turkey as a reliable NATO ally right now is a real question. It's a live question. And there are not easy answers to it. There's not really um, a way, as far as I, I know, to, to sort of get Turkey out of NATO, at least not procedurally or formally. Nobody wants that. But it's difficult to see, at least in the near term, um, this ship riding itself and the problem resolving itself anytime soon, at least as long as Erdogan is, is the president of Turkey right now. That, that said, it's important, I think, to do all we can to maintain what relationships we do have, because there will be a Turkey after Erdogan. Um, and Turkey's natural alignment, I, I, would, I would want to think, would be with the West and not with, not with Russia. So it's interesting, Rich, you mentioned a little while ago that one of the shocks to the alliance was France's relationship with the alliance in the 60s. So one of the questions, is there precedent for a nation coming out of the alliance? We haven't had that yet, We've grown over time, 29, almost 30 now. Uh, is there a precedent for some kind of withdrawal for the alliance? Not fully, but there is precedent for a second speed, if you will. And France is that uh, exception in the 60s and reintegrated. This is a recent article uh, by a colleague of ours, Omer Taspinar, with Michael Hanlon from Brookings about a Gaullist option for Turkey, which I found to be interesting. Not that it's uh, the right answer, but that institutionally the point is that there is precedent inside NATO to deal with this, and NATO has adapted over time, and maybe this is an another area where there's some adaptation. So an institutional uh, aspect uh, of Turkey's relationship. A second part of that interesting thing that we've, we've had some great discussions on is about probably no one's watching Brexit more closely, outside the Brits, than the Turks, because of the potential implications for the European Union and what that might mean for Turkey, not only in the European Union, but a precedent might set for other institutions like NATO. So some interesting uh, forward thinking there that I encourage you to, uh, to check out. Any more, uh, any more comments or questions on the topic of Turkey? Okay. Comment on your, what you said, I, I, you know, when, when you have countries that aren't, you know, living up to the standards we're used to in various areas that are nonetheless allies, and there's a few of them, and we might be one of them. Um, you, you know, you, the, the answer, the best answer probably isn't, isn't separation. It's probably, it's, please stay in the tent, let's talk, let's work this out. You know, how, how can we come to uh, uh, an, an outcome that is, acceptable for all. I, I think separation in the environment that we have described is a very dangerous, um, is a very dangerous uh, action to take because others will exploit it. And others are exploiting it as we speak. Excellent. Any more questions? One of the things that we talked about earlier was cohesion. As we were going along, I, I started ticking off all those areas where the alliance is under duress in cohesion. Russia is just one of them, and views about Russia. China is another. Italy has uh, recently got some attention by signing an agreement with China. Uh, what's going on with the Jikpoa right now in Iran and the stress that Iran is putting on the United States uh, with the allies to stay in the agreement or not? Uh, we already mentioned Turkey just now, Syria, Dr. Kordsman uh, mentioned earlier. And one that we haven't really talked about was the, the priority. We talked about priorities, but something from the South. Um, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo and I have talked a bit about uh, some of the issues that some of the southern uh, NATO nations are feeling, this pressure from immigration, the war in Syria, uh, and what's going on there, um, as a growing importance to the alliance. Um, another area, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven areas. Uh, trade wars. Sorry? Trade wars. Trade wars. So um, 
so a lot of areas uh, to uh, jeopardize the cohesion of the alliance here in this, this new environment. Uh, any additional comments, thoughts, reflections on those? Uh, well, first the panel and then Alessandra come to you. Any? I mean, my, my basic point is pick your battles and prioritize. So even though we do want 100% uh, perfect trade relations with every country with whom we trade, including the top 15 or 20, you know, how, do, how do we think about sequencing or setting priorities? Mm -hmm. So on core issues, we, have, we keep allies allies uh, and, uh, and, and focused on the real challenges. So uh, my own view is what I call putting geopolitical distance between the United States and our European allies with some of the public utterances, et cetera, is really damaging to the long-term health of the alliance because the publics in those countries are starting to uh, question in significant ways the reliability and commitment of the United States to stay with them and that we share their values and interests. So to me, it's an extremely damaging approach that, uh, could, that has the potential, if it continues over a period of time, to cause structural damage to the alliance. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen and then Nancy, I'll come to you. In building on that point a little bit and also um, onto your very excellent presentation, Tony. Um, a part of building cohesion, it's not just about identifying and coming up with you know, shared perception of the threats and how we're gonna deal with them. It's also about, let's remove some of the irritants in our relationships, right? We, we have this ongoing discussion about burden sharing and 2%, and as Tony just excellently argued, like it's, it's an input metric, and it doesn't really tell us much, and it's unachievable anyway. And we're calling this burden sharing. This is a burden sharing debate. Well, actually, burden sharing when NATO was founded was a much more normative strategic debate. It was about morally, what are we doing as allies together to stand against the Soviet Union? What we seem to be discussing now, it's cost sharing, it's bean counting, it's transactional. Well, transactions don't make great alliances. They don't lead to the political penumbra that can allow us to tackle a variety of different challenges and institutions. So my, you know, my thought would be, let's start taking out some of these irritants in the relationship. Let's, let's start moving away from things like bean counting and cost sharing and towards more normative strategic discussions about burden sharing. What kinds of capabilities, what kinds of strategies are we going to need and, and utilize to contend with this variety of threats? I have to totally agree with the previous speaker. Uh, the one caution I would give is we haven't talked about North Africa. We haven't talked about the Mediterranean, about area, out of area operations, and the whole problem of stability. And it is one that affects Central as well as North Africa. The UN just came out with population estimates last week. They also came out with estimates of dependency, and you have the IMF and others talking about economic structures. You got, and you're going to have probably about a generation and a half at a minimum of population pressure it's going to be extremely acute to move out of Africa and move north into Europe. You're talking about the question of what is going to happen in Central Asia. And we seem to have forgotten about Afghanistan, but the fact is sooner or later you have to figure out what is the outcome there and what levels of stability are you going to get. You look more broadly and you look at the so-called Arab Spring, which seemed at the time to offer all kinds of hope, and in virtually every case, the countries now have far less reason to be stable than they did in 2011. Now these are pressures we can come together and try to deal with collectively, or we can try to cope with separately. And I don't know if it has to be NATO, but somehow collective sounds better than separately. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd offer two points on that, one sort of near term and one longer term. The, the first is that um, I think the position of this president and those closest to him is, is well known, and we're kidding ourselves if we think it's 
it's going to change. Your numbers, which I understand as facts, not opinions, are not, are not moving the needle on that issue at all. If the president is reelected, the president will continue to say the things that he has said so far. He'll continue to believe the things that he has said so far. The burden sharing discussion will continue and may even intensify. And that's going to be tough. That's going to be a real challenge. I think the good news is that um, if you take the long view, NATO has endured many, many, many serious shocks, uh, not least the end of the Cold War. But I would also mention the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, which was a big shock to the alliance. Some of our closest, strongest allies not only were not with us, but, but oppo opposed that decision. In retrospect, they probably were right. Um, but the alliance and NATO, it's, it's in the DNA of the Americans. It really is. And I firmly believe that those roots are deep and that they transcend individual personalities and individual administrations. At least I'd like to think that. Why is that? Well, we've already talked about the, the shared community of values that we have, but we also have shared geopolitical interests. And these bind us together, and they have bound us together for many decades, seven decades now. I'd like to think that we can have some confidence in the enduring nature of that relationship. Of course, it's going to be hard, and of course, it's going to be difficult. But really, as Tony reminds us, having not been present at the creation, but closer to the creation than any of the rest of us, it's always been hard. It's always been difficult. And we've managed to carry on, and I'd, I'd like to think that we're going to continue to carry on. One poll. Thank you. Alessandro, you had a question. Thank you very much. Alessandro Politi, NATO Defense College Foundation. Uh, in the past, you know, during the Cold War, NATO had at least three dictatorships within, you know, the alliance membership. What do you think now is the challenge of degraded and manipulated democracies within the alliance? Thank you. Go ahead, Anthony. I think we need to be very careful about tying NATO into the process of making political judgments. I think that this is an area where nations do need to make it clear, country by country, that there are patterns of authoritarianism that are rising in some NATO countries that require us to speak out. But I think it will be much better if we speak out nation by nation and coordinate those efforts to influence states than if we try to tie an instrument of security like NATO with so many uncertainties in the forward area, which is also the location, as you pointed out, of our key vulnerabilities and of some of the worst emerging regimes to the security issue. Uh, we need to do what we can as democracies, but I do not believe that we have to push NATO into this particular mission. Any other comments on uh, the political situation, domestic politics? Populism, steering clear of that one. <laughs> Sir, a question here. Thank you. Major General Cesar Pisiński, Polish Defense Attaché. Thank you, panel, for your insights. I still see the NATO as a very important part of the security in, in Europe. And for countries like Poland, it was very important for us to join this, this team. Um, and it's supposed to be still the military alliance, which the defensive, uh, I'm sorry, the collect collective defense is the m most important part and objective. I would like to ask you about your insights about new era, which is coming right now. So post INF treaty security environment, environment. Do you see this as a challenge for the NATO and for the NATO member or as a chance to build effective deterrence in the future? Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Post INF environment? Uh, maybe the good news is, uh, uh, I mean, I think most of us in this room would prefer to be in a, in a world where both the Russian Federation and the United States are, are trying to bring down the numbers of, 
nuclear weapons and other kinds of weapons that have long, long ranges and that are, that are potentially destabilizing. Um, if we find ourselves in a situation where we have one side that's just not complying, and we've worked for years really on the INF Treaty, years, years on the INF Treaty, um, to try to bring the Russians back into compliance, and it seems clear they're just not going to do it. Um, we hope that doesn't lead to an arms race. We're much better postured to be successful if there is an arms race than the Russian Federation is, which, as Tony's pointed out, is a d level of defense spending that's something like 1 20th of the NATO alliance. Well, people aren't going to want to live in that world. It's not pleasant. It's not what, what we want or anyone else wants. But if it's forced upon us, um, then, I, then I think we, we can compete in that arena. Now, having said that, what I hope we don't see is that we see the failure of one agreement, the INF Treaty, spreading to other forms of arms control. So we, we have the START Treaty that we now need to renegotiate. We need to, we need to renew that. I think it's in our interest and in the Russians' interest to renew the START Treaty. Um, and you would hope that whatever damage has been done to the relationship over INF you know, doesn't spread to all forms of arms control. Um, and there's a danger that that will happen. So I hope it doesn't happen, but something that we're watching very, very, very closely. I yes, think sir? we need to remember just how many theater and tactical nuclear weapons are still in storage. This is not something where we destroyed the weapons. They're still there. And if you create any kind of arms race that brings them back, you have a serious increase in risk. I won't trespass into the high technology aspects of this. Uh, my colleague is probably more qualified, but I would caution that when you're running a war game and you are talking about hypersonic systems and reaction times and precision nuclear strikes using very low yield nuclear weapons, your warning structures, your reaction times, and your ability to manage escalation, to put it mildly, do not improve. When you talk about nuclear armed cruise missiles that can essentially fly around the coverage of most land based defenses, and has anybody looked at the quality of the land based defenses in NATO recently? Uh, you have another set of threats which you are not in a position as yet to deal with. And I would say that there are very, very good arguments against this tendency recently to escalate every threat with another threat. Uh, what we need, frankly, is a lot more effort to control and limit the risks of escalation. Uh, whether we can get it is another issue entirely. Okay. I think I'll make t two points. I mean, I think on, on I strongly agree with Rich on, on New Start, um, but a little political flavor is that I don't think your, your old boss, the President's going to renew an Obama treaty exactly as it was done, and so he'll probably call it brand New Start or something the way he did the NAFTA agreement or Trump New Start or something, and I think maybe that's a psychological way of getting this thing done because everybody agrees it's important. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Cordesman's points and would go even a little bit further and say, you know, you get to the, you get another five, ten years down the road and we, we need to start talking to the Russians about w what strategic stability in the 2020s, in the mid-2020s really means. You got missile defenses that are increasing in capability and in some cases dropping in terms of cost. Uh, and, 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 you know, lots of different technologies being experimented with, lots of new types of Russian system, systems, as President Putin has so proudly uh, proclaimed. Um, uh, a lot of flux and dynamism in the system. We, we better have a couple of chats so we are clear with each other about uh, what, is the, what is the balance that works for both countries look like in, in 2025. Because there's just a lot of new, new circumstances, and I, I don't think we're having that kind of serious conversation. Mm -hmm.
Kathleen, anything? I was just recall, I had a student that with unpublished paper, we did some research on the issue of uh, the need for new arms control regime, and one of his findings was we don't really have that expertise around anymore. People, we haven't done it so much uh, lately that the negotiations that have been conducted have been a different kind of quality. It hasn't been so much about arms control, and so it was a call for uh, uh, reinstitution and reinvigoration of negotiations of a specific type. Uh, so I thought that's. I can't resist. You know, is the problem expertise or the willingness of people to listen to it? <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Question over there, and then we'll come to you, ma'am. Yes, hi. Excellent discussion. Andrew Patterson with EBI. Are we reaching the point over the next decade or so where we need to really draft a farm system or a junior varsity? Colombia and Brazil come to mind. Colombia is now a partner, officially. Brazil was put forward in May as a non-NATO ally, officially, by the White House. I understand the objections. However, Colombia with 50 million, Brazil with 200 million, could provide a troop base that is larger than 20 NATO countries combined. Do we need some demographic boost from our own hemisphere? Hmm. Well, so that's an interesting question, and, and he's, of course, referring to, uh, to partners across the globe as a specific category inside the NATO partnership arrangement. I'm not familiar with which Colombia is and uh, Brazil is not. So any comments about the, this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Former life when I was working for General Lute at NSC or actually this would have been about 12 years ago, I was the director of coalition affairs and I was asked to go out and build a coalition. So we talked to Brazil and we said it'd be awesome if you sent us a brigade to fight in Iraq with us. And the Brazilian ambassador said, happy to do it, which kind of shocked me. And he said, all we ask in return is a seat on the Security Council. <laughs> said, well, that might, be, that might be tough to deliver. At the end of the day, you know, I think those nations, which I agree have, have got a lot of potential capability, would need to see it as being directly and, and really in their interest to, to take on those kinds of responsibilities and obligations. And I'm not so sure that's a very likely thing to do right now. And, you know, much more capable militarily capable big countries in the Western Hemisphere right next to each other. I'm, I'm not so sure that's something that would be in the long-term interest of regional stability or in, in our long-term interest either. I, I mean, it would take a lot of thought, I think, to think through that. But right now, I think it'd be unlikely that they would, they would see it as in their interest to be drawn into some of these kinds of obligations without you know, a, a substantial reward on the other end. And I'm not sure what we could or, offer them in that regard. They, they're not under any kind of direct military threat. Well, but, uh, I mean, just uh, to, uh, in a footnote to that, um, I think actually NATO did a pretty good job during the Afghanistan campaign, right, to, to incorporate troop contributing nations into the NATO ISAF framework. So th there's a way to do this. And NATO has these partnerships. And I, I think you're exactly right. It really depends on what uh, Brazil, Colombia, other Western Hemispheric nations would want to get out of that arrangement beyond being a troop contributing nation, being a, being a part of the, the, the uh, international coalitions to solve global challenges. I think you have to be careful. If you look at the military balance, the figures that you have from NATO or the IISS or Jane's, manpower or person power is not the issue. You have that already. What you don't have is the mix of equipment, readiness funds, and training to make that manpower or person power fully effective. And taking units out of Latin America, finding some way to move them across the Atlantic, which would probably mean competing with Lyft in a crisis at the same time you needed to move U.S. and Canadian forces, and having them arrive without tanks, really modern combat aircraft, sustainability, and a pattern of interoperability and training. I understand the tendency that we have sometimes in the media to always worry about the number of people in uniform. <laughs> 
But creating effective military forces requires one hell of a lot more than people, and more or less we already have the people. Is there anything to close that out? Say besides that, do you think it's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're almost out of time, but I have one last question, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, ma'am. Marisa Lino with various affiliations, independent at the moment. Um, Dr. Kortzman mentioned the South. How about the North? Russia's been active in <laughs> reopening bases in the Arctic, and while it cooperates on the Arctic Council, what's, uh, what do you all think about uh, the North? Excellent. And NATO's role, potential mm -hmm. role there. I think you raise a very good point, but we have two non-members of the alliance, which in some ways have become semi-members, Finland and Sweden. Uh, actually, the Swedish forces are very well funded. If you started talking about the total cost of the financial burden of the alliance, and you take them into consideration, they make a real difference. Uh, I think that it's a very serious issue, uh, but compared, and others have raised the problem of the smaller Baltic states, I think they already have, to some extent, addressed the immediate issue. Where we're going in the Arctic, and with the whole shifts between Russia, China, and everyone else, uh, that's a serious issue. But I don't think that that is as serious as the problem of the northern flank and the pressure that you see, not only to some extent on Norway, but on Finland and Sweden, and then the three small Baltic states. So differing slightly, because I, I agree with that analysis. However, um, it was on an Atlantic Council trip to Denmark last year um, that the political warfare dimensions of what's happening in the Arctic really became clear to me. So at the time, um, the, the uh, government in Copenhagen presented to us that the Greenlanders, w you know, with, with global warming, with, with Arctic ice melt, they wanted three new airports. And three new airports actually cost the, like, 35 percent of Greenlanders' GDP. So they couldn't afford it, and they wanted the Copenhagen to pay for it. Okay, and and but there became this question of, you know, Copenhagen didn't want to spend that money, um, and the, the question was, is this a, you know, Greenlanders have local autonomy, um, Copenhagen has responsibility for foreign and national security policy, and where it got really interesting is the next step in this. Well, Copenhagen didn't want to pay for it, but China was happy to, as part of BRI. And so all of a sudden, this thing about, you know, this, this local autonomy issue began to have enormous geostrategic impact and, and terrain that really matters to us. And in the end, uh, Copenhagen was able to uh, cobble together a consortium of uh, different uh, government donors funding to uh, come up with a, a counter to the Chinese CC, you know, the, the construction company, the Chinese construction company, the acronym of which is escaping me. But DOD was a part of the funding package. Like DOD monies were utilized as part of this funding package to come up with these airports in Greenland, which, and, and if, and again, because of the local autonomy versus uh, Copenhagen responsibilities, you almost had a constitutional issue play out, right? In the Arctic. Do, do, we, do we really have the tools to be able to deal with these kinds of situations? I, looking at BRI investments, I, I suspect that these are going to be challenges we're going to be increasingly deal with to have to deal with. Um, at CRS, we've been looking at US code and some of the, the mechanisms that exist for interagency collaboration on de defense technologies and, and things of that nature. There's some stuff that, that we've forgotten how to use, which I think we need to start remembering. Um, but the Arctic is extremely important, especially when you think about the, the, all the, the mechanisms that are being utilized short of warfare, o overt warfare, to accomplish strategic aims. And I'm not sure we're really prepared for that. I, I would just add that uh, I really ag uh, agree with you in, in, the, on a, in your last statement. But if you look at the longer term, <laughs> so anything. No, I don't know what the dates are, but the 
graphs I've seen of the melting of the polar ice caps means that this is going to be an extremely navigable uh, ocean. It's going to be a polar ocean you know, at some point. And so uh, to think that I think a lot of us approach the Arctic as you know, there's a little edge of coastline and there's a little bit of area where there's activity. Th this is going to be like uh, a, a new major world ocean. And I don't think um, that it's going, you know, that I think we need to think more about that and, and what it means. Today it seems marginal, but it's, it's getting increasingly less so. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll let that be the last word. I've had a lot of great uh, pleasures in my short uh, six months as the dean at the NATO Defense College, but none has exceeded this. Uh, would you please uh, join me in a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you very much. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the second half of our program. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council, and it's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here. I have to say it's a real pleasure in particular to be celebrating NATO's 70th uh, with someone that I worked for before, our partner, Ambassador Alice, uh, Alessandro Minutorizzo, who is uh, former Deputy Secretary General when I had the chance to work uh, with him and Lord Robertson at NATO headquarters. It's a real honor to be partnering with you and the NATO Defense College Foundation on today's event. Uh, and it's somewhat both wonderful and slightly intimidating to be joined by someone else that I work for as well. Thank you, Madeleine Albright, Secretary Albright. We're just delighted to have you here. There are very few Americans that represent the transatlantic alliance uh, as much as you personify it. Thank you for your leadership. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I want to take a moment just a little bit to help frame our conversations today as we think about NATO's 70th. And the starting point for what I want to talk about is that progress is not inevitable. We just began the conversations over the past hour and a half about a movement from order to disorder as we look out across the world today. And if you think about the past seven decades, it's been the United States with our NATO allies that has led the international order that's been built on a foundation of democratic values, of human dignity, open markets. This delivered better lives for our citizens and for billions of people around the world. After a pretty good historic run, it's easy to take all that for granted. But I think the purpose of today's conversation is a caution not to do that. The world as we know it is at risk. The world in which we build this alliance is at risk. And our task is to figure out how we forge a new transatlantic leadership in a dramatically changed world when we are very far from that task today. So I graduated from high school when the Berlin Wall was coming down, one of the anniversaries we're celebrating this year. Um, I had a chance to begin and pursue my career as NATO was going through an extraordinary historic adaptation of its own, out of area or out of business as it got involved in the Balkans. I began my career uh, as someone very young who was uh, working at a State Department led by Secretary Albright at the time when we were beginning to open the door to the alliance so that former adversaries could become allies, building a different kind of potential strategic partnership with Russia. There were 29 democracies when I was born. By the time I was in college, there were 77 democracies. A majority of the world for the first time in his history was living in a democratic environment. And when I went to work with Ambassador Minuto Rizzo at NATO, we felt like we had wind at our back. And then things began to change. 9-11, two what became very long wars, a pretty devastating financial and economic crisis. And it seems to have brought us and brought our community to another inflection point, as we say here at the Atlanta Council, in which the outcome is uncertain. We frame it here at the Council as a set of defining challenges that the world's facing right now that begin with the sense that we've returned to a potential of major power competition and potentially conflict, that we've got doubts about the future of democracy and open markets, challenges to the international system of rules and institutions, dramatic changes in technology which have disrupted our societies, and real uncertainty about America's role in the world. And for NATO, this means that a revisionist Russia has continued its conventional and hybrid provocations in the East while it brazenly has interfered in our democracies. A China that seeks to expand its influence in authoritarian ways onto its neighbors and increasingly in Europe. And even the mounting war of words and actions between the United States and Iran we're watching today play out as evidence that the international rules-based, values-based order is under challenge. We see instability across the Middle East and North Africa, which is a real risk to our European allies. Compounding that is this real sense of ever-growing polarization in our own nation here, in our own democracies, and our tumultuous relations between the United States and our friends and allies around the world. These challenges, both internal, external, only serve to make us look more vulnerable to our adversaries. Republicans and Democrats fighting, the United States divided from its allies. But these fault lines, I don't think, tell the whole strategic story about where we are right now, the context for how we think about our alliance. 
And I'd argue that when you take a closer look at what's happening in the national security debate in this country, you see a Congress and an executive branch that despite their dramatic differences actually have a degree of commonality and a strategic outlook and a sense that the United States is entering an era of great power competition, whether it's a declining Russia that disrupts its interests, our interests, or a rising China that risks displacing them. And when you look at the invitation to the NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg when he was here to speak before a joint session of Congress in April, the first time ever to someone that heads an international organization other than the Vatican, there is a sense, a real reminder as we've been challenged sometimes by the rhetoric of the President and others, a real sense of support for the alliance and its role in safeguarding peace, justice, and, and security in Europe, but also the democratic values that it's built on. Of course, in our relations with Europe right now, this harsh rhetoric has taken the transatlantic relationship down a bit of a tumultuous path. A path that some say could fundamentally change the relationship. When I'm in Europe now, I hear very serious conversations about how Europeans can hedge between a United States and a China in the future. Well, that's a very different vision from the one we've tried to build of the idea of a transatlantic link institutionalized within the alliance. I fear that we could be on the wrong path. I fear we might be getting off track. So I would argue that, that despite some of these divisions, and really, if you step back, you could argue that the United States and many of our, our allies are actually strategically aligned in grand strategy, perhaps more than we've been since 9-11 or 1989 even. Now bear with me, because that's not an intuitive thesis. But if you set aside some of the serious feuds between our leaders and political differences, the United States and our democratic allies, in many respects, acknowledge and see that the great challenge of the 21st century will be the competition between a free world, free societies, and those that are competition with authoritarian, corrupt, state-led capitalism, and chief among them, China and Russia. And while the current issues that we've been debating today, from burden sharing to trade issues, that these are real, they shouldn't overshadow that sense of a potential for strategic agreement in the future. With a sense of clarity of mind on both sides of the Atlantic over the threats, I would argue that we should now be reinvesting in our sense of alliances, not thinking about divesting. And so we're in this weird spot where you could argue that we have some degree of alignment on grand strategy, the challenge of a free world and authoritarian, but we're not pursuing the policies that would actually align the democracies towards that end. So we're here to commemorate the 70th anniversary of NATO, the most successful alliance in history. The alliance has succeeded in ensuring peace and security of its members in large part because of its ability to adapt, to change over time. So it's appropriate that we're gonna move into this conversation to focus on not the past, but the future. Our nation, as our nation begins to prepare what, for what is probably a long period of strategic geopolitical competition, we need to avoid getting it backwards. We need to understand that in that context, we need to put our alliances, and NATO in particular, at the core, not the periphery, of our strategy. And to make them effective, this requires U.S. leadership as a key ingredient. We need to understand, we need to figure out how to make the case, to connect the dots, that U.S. interests are best served when Washington and its allies act together today. We need our allies as force multipliers for our interests and values, particularly when we're sitting down to face or negotiate with Moscow or Beijing. So for NATO, this means responding to Russia's aggression today while preparing for the challenge posed by China's growing global reach in the future. And with regard to Russia, we need to continue the alliance's efforts to bolster its deterrence and defense in response to a revanchist Kremlin seeking to threaten its neighbors and, and our allies. In my view, I think this requires continued significant, continuous U.S. military presence in the Baltic states, Poland, in the Black Sea and Balkan, Balkan regions, supplemented by our allies. Today, our allies are forward positioned in the Baltic states. The United States should be as well. But the Russian challenge is likely to remain asymmetric, and that's why we need to continue doubling down our support, often working with the NATO with the European Union to strengthen the resilience of our democratic societies, 
whether it's energy diversification or democratic defense of disinformation. And at the same time, we need a common approach, a more common approach on how to handle China's challenge, a common approach to trade challenges, to set global standards, supporting our allies with a CFIUS-like review of foreign investments, try to forge a concerted transatlantic strategy to ensure that the free world is able to harness new technologies together, such as secure 5G, before the authoritarians do. In an era of great power competition, our goal should be to keep and expand our allies. This means we should work to keep our allies like Turkey tethered and anchored in an alliance structure that provides the security necessary for democracies to face their own difficult issues at home and to be held accountable at home. And furthermore, this means we should stand by NATO's open door policy, recognizing that welcoming new members is about expanding the zone of security and the community willing to defend freedom. Enlargement to those willing to accept the responsibility of membership should be seen as in our interests, not just in the interests of the aspirants. The US Senate will have an opportunity to weigh in on NATO's 30th member, North Macedonia, which shows that our engagement is working and that Russia's efforts to, dim to disrupt our efforts in the Balkans is not. While geopolitics have returned to Europe, today's competition is global. Russia's back in the Middle East, Latin America, witness China's global reach. So recognizing this reality, we, we need to think about how we could lead a more concerted effort to thicken the political bonds and operational ties between NATO and its global partners. Today, these partnerships are underinvested assets at NATO headquarters, and we should begin to change that. We should begin by focusing on the South, where instability is an existential challenge for Europe. It was actually under Ambassador Minuturizzo as Deputy Secretary General where the Alliance began to reach out and to build these partnerships. But we sort of have dropped the ball, and we need to raise our level of ambition in how to forge meaningful partnerships in North Africa, the Levant, the Gulf. But we should also think about how we might consider formalizing our links among US treaty allies in Europe and those in Asia, from Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Think about these alliance, fostering alliance-like links among many of these partners, whether it's in India or Latin America. And to build out a network of alliances with the United States at the center to provide a more capable and intentional global democratic response to the authoritarian challenge. We've talked a lot about defense spending this morning, this afternoon, and I just would underscore that the current defense burden sharing debate I think was captured well in the opening session. That the debate misplaces the focus on probably what's strategically important and can potentially undermine our credibility. It's something that I think we have to move beyond. So the United States is right in expecting its allies to do more but we need to remember that our own efforts are in our interest. They are not acts of charity. In an era of geopolitical competition, America's friends and allies are the United States' best comparative advantage. Viewing our allies that way would compel, I would argue, consistent policies that would lead our alliances towards united fronts and standing up to aggression. And our defense strategy should inevitably drive Washington to bolster and expand its alliances, not disrupt them. Indeed, the Congress, the administration, the American people could view our alliances as national strategic assets been built up over time. And as such, you could argue that each administration serves as a steward of these assets with the responsibility to defend, to strengthen, to lead them. U.S. leadership, after all, will remain the decisive element in determining the success of NATO's future. So as we say here at the Atlantic Council, we are truly stronger with allies. And part of the task as we mark NATO's 70th is to figure out how we help reframe the nature of our debate, reframe how we think about our allies and our partners going forward. So with that in mind, I first of all want to thank everybody who's here, who's been involved in this, because many of you have made your own contributions to the Alliance over the years. You're actively part of helping to forge and think through and strengthen this case. So with that, I want to be able to transition and turn over. I'm going to invite, uh, where is Ian Brzezinski? I'm going to invite Ian Brzezinski up to the stage.
uh, is one of the key uh, individuals who's been at the heart of helping to bolster our alliance over time and his, uh, his guests uh, uh, for the next discussion. Um, Ian, please come to the stage and we'll, we'll set this up for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Damon. Good to go, gentlemen, dearly, please. There are names on the seats. I'm right here. Get up. Oh, you are. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Ian Brzezinski, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council, and it's a real privilege uh, to moderate, to serve as a moderator for this panel towards a future NATO strategy. And let me thank Fred and the Defense College and NDU for hosting this, and it's a real honor for me to be up on the stage before Secretary Albright. Our first panel talked about the challenges, the changing strategic environment that the Alliance faces. And it's a pretty grim picture. The return of great power competition, a resurgent Russia, a rising China, uh, continued threats of terrorism and regional instability, disruptive technologies uh, that cover everything from new forms of social media that are disrupting everything from how people see things to, to elections, to hypersonic missiles and AI that can completely change the escalation uh, dynamics of, of, of confrontation and crisis and conflict. It's a more challenging, it's a more global, it's a more complex international environment that's before the alliance. And then Damon came up and gave an important and powerful message on how important it is for the alliance and its partners to stand together, to leverage your capacities. And what I'd like just to add to his point is that in many ways in this complex world, there's reasons to be optimistic about the West's position in this. When you look at the democratic community democracies that, is cons that constitutes NATO, they are in a very strong position. It may not be as strong as before, but stronger than many of our all of our adversaries combined. They can leverage unmatched political legitimacy. More than half of the, G uh, the world's GDP and military forces that are absolutely second to none. That's not a bad starting place when addressing this, war this new complex and dangerous world. And that's what our panel is about today. Not so much what is the nature of this world, but what should NATO be doing as we look forward? What should be the key elements of its strategy? How can it marshal these advantages the Western community of democracies has? So I have a great panel that brings together operational military experience, strategy, developing NATO's key strategy documents, senior experience in government, and also a dose of the EU, which I'm very grateful for. General John Nicholson, right next to me, <laughs> a strong dose of, uh, of, uh, of an EU perspective. General John Nicholson bring, comes from a storied family of m senior U.S. and British military commanders. He has a 36-year career in the U.S. Army. He started in, as an infantryman, always an infantryman, commanded the 82nd Airborne Division. Among his many commands, he served four times in NATO, once as a commander of NATO Landcom, Land Command, and he spent six years in Afghanistan last three years being the commanding officer of the 41 nation coalition there. NPR, National Public Radio, said no American soldier knows the battleground of Afghanistan better than Army General John Nicholson. Charlie Kupchin, next to him, I met Charlie first time in Ukraine in 1993. He's a senior fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor at Georgetown University. Uh, he served twice in the White House in the NSC, the National Security Council, as a director for European affairs under President Clinton, and then as the senior director as a special assistant to the president for European affairs under President Obama. Uh, he's also served before that in the policy planning staff. Uh, Derla Doyle is the head of the political security and development section of the EU delegation here in Washington, D.C. She's been a member of the European Action Service since 2014, and before coming to Washington, she was covering Europe and Central Asia in Brussels. She served previously in Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with posts in Italy and Shanghai. Uh, 
and Hans Benedict, distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, also an adjunct professor, adjunct political scientist at the Rand Corporation, is someone who's had his fingertips, his fingerprints on probably every major NATO defense initiative in the last two decades. Uh, he was a founding father of the NATO Response Force. Uh, he's a founding father of, of, of the recent uh, 4x30s initiative that's driving forward NATO readiness. He served twice in the NSC too, also as a senior uh, special assistant to the president for defense policy. So I'm gonna start off with, with General Nicholson. And I want to, you, you serve two key posts in, in the Alliance among your four uh, tours in, in, in the Alliance. Commander of NATO LANCOM, and I, that brings to mind high intensity uh, conflict, marshalling large scale forces, and then counterinsurgency work <coughs> in Afghanistan. When you look forward and you see what's before NATO, a world that's including not just counterinsurgency, but increasingly the risk of high intensity conflict that comes with great power competition, what are the lessons you bring what are the priorities that should define NATO as it charts its way forward in this, in this challenging time? <clears throat> Thank you, Ian, and, uh, and thanks to the organizers of the conference, David, and, and for this opportunity. Madam Secretary, good to see you. Uh, and the, so I think you, you pointed out the, the, the issue. We have a spectrum of, of uh, potential challenges in front of us, not only the conventional challenges posed by uh, Russia and their recent behavior, but also all the way to terrorism and even migration, which of course is a great concern as a national security issue to many of the states of the alliance. So what I wanted to do is touch upon some of the points I think that bring out the strength from a military perspective to illustrate what I think are some of the strengths of this alliance uh, going forward and things that we're going to need uh, as we uh, deal with future challenges, not being certain exactly what form they'll take. And so just a few weeks ago, I was in uh, Normandy for the 75th uh, anniversary of D-Day with, with Dr. Hooker and other friends, and as we, as we were uh, sitting in St. Marigli's having lunch and discussing the, uh, the war, uh, one of the concepts we discussed was that NATO was really born on the beaches of Normandy, and that since American troops entered the continent of Europe along with British and Canadian and other allies, we, we had never left, and Europe had experienced an unprecedented period of peace, as David talked about. And so this, uh, this highlights the strength and importance and impact of NATO. And I am in that school that agrees that NATO is the strongest and most effective alliance the world has seen. And I say that as a military professional from a military perspective. And when I say that in terms of strength, I'm referring to you look at the combined gross domestic product, the population, the size of our militaries, the defense budgets, in all of these categories we have enormous strengths. You can argue about how we're using them. Can, they, can we be more effective or efficient? Absolutely, we can we discuss those points, but it can't be denied that this is the strongest and most effective alliance in the world. Article five, so this article at the core of NATO, collective self-defense, as, as America, I need to restate it. I know we talk about this a lot, but article five was invoked to come to our aid, and our allies came to our assistance uh, after we were attacked, came to Afghanistan, and they're still there. 18 years later, providing one third of the boots on the ground. And so this is, uh, and as a soldier, I will never forget that. But one of the impacts of that has been the uh, relationships among the senior commanders of the military forces of NATO have never been better. The cohesion is tight. We have worked closely together for years. And I think this creates sort of an intellectual and a personal uh, bond that enables us to deal with challenges as they come forward, no matter what they, what they are. Um, coalitions are not easy. They've never been easy. You know, D Dwight Eisenhower did not have an easy time with this coalition. And this, uh, it, it always takes work. But in my view, the, uh, the legitimacy that comes from operating as an alliance, as a coalition, money cannot buy this legitimacy. And when you look at what has been a very long and challenging time in Afghanistan, our legitimacy of being there has really not been questioned because it is based on the United Nations, NATO, this coalition of nations that have continued to step forward and, uh, and demonstrate the legitimacy with their presence. And we as Americans, even though of course we, we need to have the capability to act unilaterally and we may need to do that from time to time, uh, I believe going into the future, it's acting as a member of a coalition or as an alliance with the legitimacy that comes with that is going to be essential to our success. Now making coalitions work 
requires qualities that you don't normally find on a list of military virtues. Things like patience and humility and emotional intelligence and stamina. Okay, but these are essential to making coalitions work. And again, I'd say as a product of our experience in a, in a very long campaign together, uh, we have developed many of these qualities amongst the leadership in NATO. These qualities then enable us to attain a unity of effort and an interoperability. And the start point of that is an intellectual ability to work together and a human ability to work together. Now, uh, interoperability is critical, as was discussed in the previous panel, because it provides options to our policymakers short of war. So our ability to interoperate as an alliance quickly, responsively, provides options short of war to our policymakers. Um, but interoperability costs money in terms of readiness, modernization, training, and as we heard, we, we are missing the mark here. We are, we are not where we need to be in terms of modernization, readiness, uh, and investment. So if, if you were to say, what's my biggest concern going forward, uh, I'd say my, my, my major concern as, as a former senior commander within NATO is the lack of dialogue with the Russians. So after retirement, I joined a group uh, run by Harvard University called the Elba Group. And as we prepared for a recent meeting in Reykjavik, uh, it was striking to me how little dialogue is occurring with the Russians, between the United States and the Russians. And so this, um, from a military standpoint, uh, this could create a situation where a, a miscalculation or a mistake leads to a confrontation that then, because we're not talking, uh, spins out of control and could create a very dangerous circumstance. So uh, continuing to dialogue, figuring out how we, we should dialogue, what's the appropriate means of dialogue, and opening up those channels is going to be absolutely critical uh, going forward. So again, just to uh, summarize, internally, Going forward, focusing on our cohesion, our interoperability. Externally, it's, it's dialogue, it's communications, and engaging to anticipate and hopefully deter uh, future uh, conflicts before they, before they turn into them. Thank you. So strong call for continued modernization, accelerated modernization of capabilities, uh, a reminder that we need to engage our adversaries uh, so we can avoid at least the miscalculation and maybe even push things onto a more stable direction. Let me turn to Charlie. Charlie, you, you, you sat at the NSC and you, you've seen the, the tensions that go on between national priorities and the NATO mission. And that can actually uh, be a grinding sound grist in the, gear making, the gears of the alliance, slowing down its ability to operate. In this world that's increasingly globalized, in which, in which financial and military and political crises and events happen now at lightning speed, how worried are you about the Alliance's ability to operate at the speed of conflict, at the speed of crisis. Uh, is that a fair concern? And if so, what needs to be done? Uh, let, me, let me begin by um, putting out what I, what I hope will be a, a, an upbeat opening comment. Uh, and that is, I, <clears throat> I have to say that, that even though uh, we gather here at the Atlantic Council on the 70th anniversary at a time when we're probably more anxious about the Atlantic relationship and, and NATO than perhaps at any time since World War II. Uh, I come out of the last couple of years struck by how resilient NATO has been in the face of some pretty considerable <laughs> lashes. Uh, you know, to, to have an American president insult allies talk about withdrawing from NATO. These are, these are pretty serious developments, but I have to say that I am uh, uplifted by the degree to which there has been a rally to defend NATO. And this leads me to believe that the, that the, the foundations, the political and strategic foundations of the alliance are actually in very good shape. The House and the Senate have been passing resolutions one after another in support of NATO. Damon, you mentioned that uh, the Secretary General of NATO was invited to give a, an address to a joint session of Congress. That's unheard of. What was that? It was a statement to the President of the United States, don't mess with this alliance. And if you look at public opinion in the United States, the needle has not moved. 
Chicago Council on Foreign Relations showed that 75% of the American public believes that the United States should either maintain or increase its support to NATO. That's exactly the same percentage that supported when Obama was president. President Trump has not moved the needle on that front. So yes, there's a lot to worry about, but I also think that we should see uh, the last couple of years as a sign that this is a, as a concern that has an, an enormous amount of staying power on both sides of the Atlantic. So in terms of what I would, what I would like to see done to, to kind of align national priorities, what would be my wish list to kind of make the next 10 years a, a strong decade, uh, the first would be to get Europe to actually turn the corner on defense and not see this current push, whether you call it the European intervention force or structured cooperation or framework, framework nation, whatever you want to call it, but to see this as a time at which Europe actually begins to have capability. Uh, and I say that in part because I believe that the United States will value the alliance more and more if it has a more capable partner on the other side of the Atlantic. <coughs> and it's not just President Trump, it's President Obama and those before him who were quite insistent. You need to be able to be our partner. You need to be able to carry out operations. You need helicopters that fly. And that hasn't really happened yet. There's a lot of talk, but this str strikes me as a moment at which Europe really needs to make this happen. Uh, and, and I also believe that there will be times in the next few years when something bad happens in the European theater and the United States is not in a position to come to the party and Europe will need to act. We know that will happen. It might be in North Africa, it might be in the Caucasus, it might be in the Balkans, but you can't wait for the rainy day. Now is the time to make that, to make that happen. So that would be the, the first, uh, list, first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say, and I don't know how to articulate what to do about this, but it's, it's, a, it's a concern that I have, and maybe Ambassador Rizzo or Damon, others who have actually worked at NATO could jump into the conversation later. But it, you know, it, I'm struck by the degree to which NATO is, on the one hand, about the stuff that, that you worked every day, you know, the, the hardware, the strategy, the stuff on the ground, but it's also about values. It's also about defending countries, not just because they are of strategic importance, it's they are of strategic importance because of who they are because they stand by liberal democratic values. Uh, and I worry that we are passing through a historical moment in which our liberal democratic foundations are being tested. In Poland, in Hungary, in Italy, in Turkey, in this country. And we need to do something about that. And I think NATO should be in the game. In the first instance, in the European context, it's the EU that has been trying to put pressure on Poland and Hungary to redress some of the steps that have been taken that are at odds with the rule of law. But NATO should be in this game because NATO is about defending values and not just territory. Uh, how, how it gets in that game, I don't know. Should there be some kind of new political committee that that assesses countries and makes statements when they, uh, when they see member states that are backsliding. I, d I don't know what, how to deal with this, but I, I think it, it should be on NATO's agenda because this, this, this is what NATO is all about. And I also think that if there were to be such a committee, there are issues that need to be on the NATO agenda that are not traditional NATO issues. Belt and Road. That should be discussed among NATO allies. Nord Stream 2, cyber security, election intrusion. These are core security issues for Europe. Uh, they ought to be a, a, a part of the NATO conversation. Again, I'm not quite sure how to make that happen, uh, but uh, we need to, to find a way of bringing these into the conversation.
the third would be to um, find, I don't know what you'd call this, but, but to find a mechanism for creating coalitions of the willing when it comes to NATO operations. I, I think we're moving into a world in which the, the main action of NATO is not going to be along the so-called central front. Uh, NATO, you know, NATO has still has a lot of business to do with Russia, but if I had to guess, where will NATO be seeing action? It's not in the Baltics. It's not in Poland. It's in non-members. Uh, and so I would begin to think about flexible mechanisms for creating coalitions of the willing when you can't get full NATO agreement on these and, and a kind of plug and play. And that would bring uh, opportunities for some of the partners that Damon was mentioning, whether it's the South Koreans or the Australians and others to, uh, to uh, get involved in, in the same way that they did in Af Afghanistan. And then the final uh, thing I'd put on my list would be uh, I think NATO has done a, a very good job, quiet job, because it's not in the headlines, of getting ahead of the curve and taking its good practices and its knowledge and its experience and exporting it to other regions. Uh, in the Middle East, through the Mediterranean Initiative, I think they should be, uh, NATO should be very active with the African Union, with ASEAN, with the Gulf Cooperation Council. Because again, I, I think we are moving into a world in which the US and its NATO allies are not gonna be the providers of last resort anymore. The world is changing. Uh, we need to create the capacity, the public goods, for other bodies to do what NATO has done. Uh, and so I would lean into the programs that, that you helped begin, uh, the partnership programs in many different parts of the world, so that should NATO can, can pass on as a legacy uh, its good practices, its knowledge, its experience to other regions. It's a good list. It's a powerful list. It's maybe a tough list encouraging the Europeans to move out on defense, uh, bringing in the alliance, uh, a wider set of issues, uh, including democracy. That could be, that could put, be grist in the, in, the, uh, in, in the system. Flexible responses, coalitions of willingness, kind of like what we did a little bit in, in, in Libya, and then exporting stability, which of course requires resources. Dirla, you're a brave person coming here in a NATO, NATO setting here. Could share us from your perspective sitting in the EU how you anticipate the two organizations working more effectively to address the challenges of this more complex, challenging world? How do we avoid uh, institutional collisions and, and perhaps sometimes endlessly and divisive theological debates over the rights and roles of the two institutions? Um, thank you, Ian, and hello, everybody, and Madam Secretary as well. And um, thank you for um, the invitation to participate. Um, I think it actually is very important to have um, maybe not such a defense NATO expert voice on this panel. Um, so I maybe start briefly just talking a little bit about the European Union and then move on to EU NATO cooperation. Um, the European Union, in my view, and I think in the view of many, is essentially a peace project at its core. I mean, it started from the remnants of, of World War II and it was a group of nations coming together to form the coal and steel community, which essentially they were the, the raw materials of war, if you like. Um, but gradually, as it's ex expanded and as the world has changed, it is now 28 sovereign nations together, in a sense, I think, because they realize that to face current challenges, they need to work together. Um, and you can't do it alone. And that extends also outside of the European Union in terms of working with partners. I think it's true of NATO, it's true of the European Union, it's true of the United States. Um, given the multifaceted challenges that we now face, none of us can do it on our own. So, I mean, I was very happy to hear Damon in his address refer to the importance of allies, um, the importance of meeting these challenges together. I think he was absolutely right on China. I mean, I think Europe does not want to be in a position where it's seen as trying to hedge the two. What we would like would be to work together, for example, with the US on China. But, you know, within the multilateral system, that's what we believe in. Um, I was also very happy that Charles referred to values. Um, I think that that sometimes gets lost a little bit. Um, and at the end of the day, if you look at the transatlantic alliance, that's what we share. We are more similar than we are different and will continue to be, but we need to defend those values together. Um, in terms of the defense spending, there's been a lot of focus, I think, on 2% um, and on military spending. And I think there are two things there. 
I mean, one is there has been progress made um, in recent years. I think the figures for 2018 show that amongst the European allies now, it's reached its highest level. There's still a long way to go. That's largely a matter for individual member states, member, members of NATO um, to decide. Um, but I also think that it loses sight a little bit of the other areas that you need in terms of ensuring security. Um, and that's where I think the European Union can play a very complementary role to NATO. You know, we have what we call an integrated approach, which focuses increasingly on um, missions overseas, the so civilian and military missions, but also, you know, on development, on the rule of law, on governance, the kind of work we do with the countries in the West Western Balkans as EU accession countries, trying to bring them up to standards, um, security sector reform. We also do a lot with the Eastern partners, particularly Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, across the whole range of areas. So I think that gets a little bit lost sometimes, and it's, it's, um, it's what the European Union can bring in terms of soft power. Um, and then finally, on EU NATO cooperation, I actually think that's a very positive story, and we have a very good story to tell. We have come an extraordinary distance since 2016 in particular, when we had the first joint declaration. And um, we had in Warsaw, we had then the Brussels Declaration 2018. And uh, we now have 74 actions of joint cooperation across a whole range of areas, from cyber to hybrid, counterterrorism, um, operations working together in the Mediterranean. I mean, it's really very extensive. Um, there is a very broad dialogue that takes place. We have meetings at ministerial level, um, meetings of the political security committee in the NAC. Um, so I think, I think that also maybe is not recognized so much. Um, and yeah, so I, I, would, I would really point to that um, going forward. And just, yeah, the need to, to continue to work together on challenges. I'll say a brief word about the European Security and Defence Initiatives, because there has been a lot of focus on those recently. Um, and this is essentially a recognition at European level that we need to do more in terms of developing capabilities. Uh, and it's set aside money, first of all, under the European Defence Fund in the next funding period from 2021. It's not a huge amount of money in the grand scale of things. It would be 13 billion, more or less. But it's a recognition that we need to encourage the member states to spend better. Um, European defense budget is not insignificant. It's, I think, around 227 billion. But it's probably very inefficient, because you have 28 countries who, to a certain extent, have done their own thing up until now. So that's what the European Defense Fund is trying to do, and also permanent structured cooperation, which is encouraging countries to come together on joint projects to develop their capabilities. Those capabilities, in turn, will reinforce NATO. We have a single set of forces. So the forces for European countries are NATO forces. They're the UN forces. So those capabilities, essentially, are also going to strengthen NATO. And finally, I would say military mobility is a, is a very good story. Um, very practical cooperation in terms of transport infrastructure, things like customs, borders in Europe. Um, so I think, I think it's, the progress is slow, but there has been progress. Um, we obviously have a long way to go. I, I think you're absolutely right that people tend to underestimate the complementarity between NATO and the EU as it's exercised in the Balkans and elsewhere, where the alliance is using its force capabilities and the EU is using its rule of law, governance, democracy, building economic reform capabilities. That's a holistic approach. And that when the two institutions can exercise together like that, that's when they have a real, a real impact. Hans. I can't help but push you in this direction with uh, Secretary Albright here. Rhetoric, of course, counts, but documents really matter. <laughs> documents set priorities. Uh, documents can be waved on tables and be used to pound allies and colleagues into, into action. Uh, you were involved in the effort that uh, Secretary Albright led in rewriting the NATO strategic concept. When you look forward uh, in, in in the environment we face today, in the environment before the alliance today, is there a need for a new strategic concept? Is this the right time to do it in light of some of the political leaders we have in the alliance? What would be distinctive and new about the strategic concept you would bring to the table? Thank you, Ian. Uh, first, let me say I've been involved in NATO affairs for more than four decades, and the 10 months that I spent with Secretary Albright doing the last strategic concept would be one of the highlights of my time in NATO. Um, before I look forward, let me look back for just a minute or two uh, 
Strategic concepts have played a very large role in the history of the Alliance. I count seven uh, through the seven decades uh, that we are celebrating today of the Alliance. Uh, and these strategic concepts have come at inflection points in the, in the health of the Alliance. Uh, and they tend to uh, shift the focus of the Alliance and build new consensus. Uh, during the Cold War, we had four of these. Um, and I won't go through all of the details, but the two most important were massive retaliation and flexible response. During the Cold War, this was primarily about hard defense and nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence. After the Cold War, we've had three. Uh, there was one that came out of the uh, Rome Summit in 1991, a second that came out of the Washington Summit that you'll remember, Secretary, uh, in 1999, then you had the 2010 uh, the final strategic concept that came out of Lisbon. Um, and these strategic concepts historically have created a new consensus when the old consensus is withering. So that's the nature, and I think we are in a point today where we are, we are at an inflection point, and we do need a new strategic concept. So the answer to your question is yes, we need it, uh, but no, not right now, because I don't think we're quite ready. I think maybe in a year or two we'll be ready. So <laughs> um, let me first say that um, there are still some valid element, elements to the strategic concept that Secretary Albright uh, and then uh, subsequently the Secretary General designed. Uh, the most important of those are the three, the three core tasks. Uh, and these at the time expanded the, the mission of the Alliance. So it, it's collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. And those three core tasks, the Alliance has been able to use those three buckets, if you will, to uh, operate uh, throughout this changing uh, environment that we've been in. Uh, there are other elements that are still quite valid, the open door partnerships, the need for reform uh, and transformation. Uh, secondly, I'd say that uh, over this last decade, uh, there have been three key summits that have gone beyond the Lisbon Summit, and each of those summits and the summit declarations have taken additional steps uh, to begin to modify the 2010 strategic concept. Uh, we also now have had new political guidance. Uh, today we have a new uh, uh, military strategy, which is still under review, uh, MC404. Uh, so all of these things have begun to shift uh, and adjust to the new environment that we're living in. Uh, but I do think uh, that needs to be consolidated. Uh, but before we can consolidate that, we need trust. You, you have to trust each other. What, what I remember most vividly about our experience, uh, uh, Secretary Albright, in 2009-2010 uh, was uh, that the process was so important. We came out with a good document, but it was 10 months of process, consulting everywhere throughout the Alliance. And to do that, the, that process builds trust. Uh, and I think we can use that process, hopefully soon, to be able to rebuild that trust. Uh, so, that's, so the answer to your question is, yes, we need it. No, not right now, but soon. <laughs> now, let me just very quickly go through uh, a list because um, I, I agree with Charlie and, and Damon. I think I've made a list of the things that I'd like to see in a new strategic concept. Uh, I'm going to do this very quickly because it overlaps a lot, a lot with what Charlie and Damon said. Uh, but I, we need to articulate a new consensus on the nature of the threat. Uh, there is not really a, a consensus on the Russian threat or on the Chinese challenge or on what we do about Iran. Uh, and I, so I think I would try to use the strategic concept to articulate uh, and build that consensus. Secondly, I think we, re we need to re restate the fundamental purpose of the alliance. This is about defense, but it's also about values. It's about maintaining democracy. It's about rule of law. And that gets to Damon's point uh, about this larger challenge that we face. That's got to be there. Third, we have to take additional steps to enhance deterrence. Uh, we had talked in the last uh, session about some of the 
problems we have with maintaining uh, deterrence today. Rich, in particular, uh, focused on this. We need to do more on the conventional side to build deterrence, but we don't really have a nuclear doctrine today within the alliance. We need a new nuclear doctrine that enhances deterrence. Uh, fourth, uh, we, uh, there is a hybrid war underway and we are losing it. We need to use the strategic concept to understand that better. Uh, and uh, I mean, there, part of this is cyber, uh, part of it is the little green men problem. But from my perspective, the biggest problem uh, is the strategic communications piece of this, using social media to divide the alliance. We have to figure out <coughs> how to respond to that. We can use the strategic concept to do that. Next on my list would be a southern strategy. We don't have one within the alliance. We talk about projecting stability. We talk about 360 degrees, but really don't understand the complex nature of the threats that are coming at us from the south. Part of that is instability, but part of it is the fact that Russia and China are there now, too. We have to be able to figure out how to, how to manage that. Uh, we have a number of gray areas, whether it, or border areas call it, whether it is Ukraine and Georgia or whether it's the high north. We need to come together on how to manage those uh, challenges. Uh, decision making. Uh, you were talking earlier about operating in coalitions when you can't make decisions within the alliance. Um, that's part of this, but we also have to, we may not, the consensus rule may not apply to everything. There may be cases where we have to go beyond that, find new ways uh, to make decisions within the alliance. And then finally uh, is the burden sharing issue. And I can talk about that uh, later if you'd like, Ian. I, I would just say we have to move from uh, input measures like 2% and 20% to output measures. We have to, we have to make that intellectual shift uh, and we could use a strategic concept to do that. So uh, more later. You Thank like. you. Well, that's a good list of more than just five. That's about six or seven uh, key elements of a strategic concept. And let me follow up on the burden sharing point because it might be something that Darla could, could fill in on also. We had an interesting conversation in the last panel on the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of 2% and 20%. 2% uh, the standard of nations committing at least 2% of their GDP to uh, defense and ensuring that 20% of that is geared towards uh, investment into, into, into kit. What do you think of that? Is that a, a sufficient um, benchmark, Hans? To me, it's not perfect, but politically it's the most effective way to squeeze resources, military resources out of allies. Let me first say that this has been a historic issue. I can remember Mansfield amendments. I remember Nunn amendments trying to do this. So we have historically been trying to get the alliance to do more. It's also not a partisan issue. Uh, President Trump has seized on it in a fairly awkward way, but this is, this is an issue that is where there is bipartisan support, bipartisan support to have allies do more. Uh, there's actually, uh, if you look back historically, there is a decade between 1970 and 1980 when the alliance, the European part of the alliance, grew its defense spending by $80 billion in real terms. So historically, we're not asking for something that hasn't happened before. If you look at the, at the defense spending trends uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, the European trend is a constant decline if you're looking at percentage of GDP spent on defense from 2.5% to about 1.5%. The United States is essentially a V. Uh, we started 4.5% uh, of GDP uh, leaving as, as uh, President Clinton came in. Uh, that went down uh, to, so we, were, we took a bigger defense cut than the Europeans did during that 10 year period. But then after 9-11, this is the big difference, after 9-11, <coughs> We were hit, the Europeans weren't. So our defense spending went way up, fighting two major wars, and the Europeans kept going down. So that is where the lines crossed. Uh, now, having said that, 2% uh, was a two by four. We got their attention. It's actually done some good. Uh, Secretary General has used this $100 billion figure uh, of increased defense spending from Europeans since uh, 2016. So positive things have come out of this. Uh, I would say, though that a different kind of measure would be useful. And what I would suggest 
NATO has a level of ambition. It's two plus six. Fight two major joint operations and six small ones. Very simply, Europe ought to be able to do half of that on its own. It's a very simple notion. We divide the labors, uh, and, and if we can do that, Europe has a, a goal, an output goal that can use, and we ought to stop beating up on the Europeans for PESCO and other things where we, we ask them to do more, they do more, and we beat up on them for doing more. So let them manage this themselves and come up with that new capability. Richard Darla. On this, does this ring true to you? I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit of a critic of uh, the EU role in, in, in defense policy. And par part of the reason why I'm a critic is because it doesn't seem to really amount to much. EDF will be 18 billion euros over seven years, which is, which is barely even half a drop in, in, in the bucket requirements. Could the EU take on something like that? Gear its, it's metrics to something more, more ambitious, potentially more useful to transatlantic security requirements? Well, I mean, I think NATO is going to remain the cornerstone of, of European security. The, Euro the European Union is not going to take that over. That's not what we're about. And when I talk about complementarity, that's, that's what I mean in a sense. I mean, we have developed the security and defense policy. Um, we now have you know, a number of military and civilian missions around the world. I think that where we can help is by focusing maybe on regions that NATO is not so present, for example, the Horn of Africa. Um, but I don't, think it, I don't think we need to start doing defense in the way that NATO does defense. But I think what the European Union can do is, on the expenditure side, encourage member states to work better together. But, I mean, the 13 billion is not a huge amount of money, but that is literally just these EU-funded projects. I mean, the, the European defense budget, as I said, is, is significantly bigger than that. And this is largely a decision for the member states. But I think it's a start, and I think that there is a recognition that we need to be more efficient and try and stop the duplication and indeed, the question of burden sharing has been raised at, at very political levels. Um, but I think that we will continue to also work on all of those other areas, um, more of the kind of the soft power. And, and I think that the focus that was mentioned on regional organizations is very important. The European Union has been very supportive of, I think, the African Union, for example, and encouraging those regional organizations to also step up and take more responsibility locally. And that's somewhere where I think we can also we can also help. But the, the discussion within NATO and European partners is, is really a NATO discussion. Mm -hmm. It's not one I think for me as the European Union representative to get <laughs> into. <laughs> here, here. Ian, I, I want to jump in yeah. on the burden sharing. In the case of Afghanistan, the EU's led the donor effort uh, and, and raised uh, 15 billion dollars. You know, as recently in the 2016 donors conference, you had the Warsaw Conference where NATO agreed to extend military assistance for another four years. And the EU followed up a few months later with a donor conference where 15 billion in pledges were generated. And so I think that's an important uh, point on complementarity. And, and of course, many of the, the member states are members of NATO also. And so the, the Germans uh, put together a coalition of 19 nations in the northern part of Afghanistan. And they've maintained that. And they're also, of course, one of the principal donors as well. So um, I, I think you'd, you'd hear from uh, uniformed officers in NATO, not American, but, but whose, whose members are part of the EU, what, I, what I've heard, anecdotal, not scientific, but they would say if you've got one dollar to, uh, to spend on defense, spend it on NATO, vice, mm -hmm. an EU structure that might be duplicative. So I, th I think generally speaking from a military efficiency standpoint, you're going to hear that from the uniform military. Yeah. Just on that point, you just mentioned that those security and defense initiatives I mean, they have very much been taken forward in close coordination with NATO, also in terms of trying to align the various planning documents. Um, so really, they are intended to reinforce. And as you, as you point out, 22 mm -hmm. EU member states are members of NATO. So, Charlie, I want to push back a little bit, Joe, on, on, on your point about bringing in these so-called non-military issues, democracy, a, a political uh, committee to kind of help review or judge or nudge allies that are slipping backwards on in, in, in democratic standards. I mean, at a time when the world is more, more complex and there are more centrifugal dynamics in the alliance, at a time when you need the alliance to be able to act with dispatch uh, to a fast-breaking crisis, aren't you at risk of bringing into the alliance dynamics that actually kind of lock up the alliance politically and preclude it from its ability to move with, 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 with speed and with haste? I guess you could you could say that <clears throat> what I am calling for runs that risk. My response would be that it is a risk that we have to run. Mm 
Uh, and that's because if you know, if you were to, if you were to say, you know, what, what, what am I most worried about? It's not China. It's not Russia. It's us. Right? Because if we don't survive this moment, right? If historians look back at 2018 and 2019 and 2020 and say that that is when the era that opened with World War II came to an end, we're in deep trouble. Uh, and uh, I don't think that that's what's happening here, but I have to say that I cannot say with confidence that I see the pendulum swinging back from the political extremes to the center. I, I think the jury is out. Yes, the European Union election, the sky didn't fall. The populists only won 25%. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we still, Brexit looms. In Italy, the political center has collapsed. If it can collapse in Italy, it can collapse in France. Uh, and to, to me, these, this is the defining issue of our day. Uh, if we get this issue right, I'm confident we'll be able to deal with Russia and China. If we get this issue wrong, good night. Lights out. Uh, and that's why it seems to me that the premier security institution of the West has to take up these issues, because it's, it's the premier security issue of our time. And so yes, it's messy. Yes, if you start talking about, about Turkey, and you talk about the Polish court system and you, in NATO, it, people are going to get uncomfortable. But I think that we have to do that. It's too important. Before I turn the, the, the mic over to, to all other partners, Participants, I just want to ask one last question that relates to China, uh, and it's it's a NATO issue, it's a transatlantic issue, and I was really struck by the last foreign ministerial here in Washington, of how China permeated the dialogue. Um, if it wasn't formally on the agenda, it was it was the big cloud looming over. From your perspective, what should the alliance be expected to do in the Pacific, in light of uh, Ch China's rising assertiveness? I mean, I recognize it's not an immediate military threat to European territory, but Europeans have a vested interest in protecting the international order and the rules that keep peace and on the basis of prosperity and, and, and freedom. So it strikes me that NATO must have some sort of role to play in the Pacific, to with the allies or Pacific powers. W what is the appropriate role? What should NATO be preparing for as we look forward? Hans? Well, in, in the current environment, I would love to see more European nations participating in freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea because that is important to Europe. Uh, it's as important to Europe as it is to the United States to maintain freedom of navigation throughout that area. And a, it would be a very, I, some of this happens, but I'd like to see much more of it. Charlie? Um, I, would, I would set a list of priorities. My first would be do no harm. Uh, because I do worry that in the absence of some kind of coordinated U.S.-European approach, we may find ourselves at odds. It's already starting to happen. And, it, and it's not just U.S.-Europe, it's intra-European, where you have the Chinese showing up in Greece, showing up in Italy, getting access to Piraeus, getting access to Trieste. These are major ports with rail links right up into the heart of Europe. That has strategic implications as well as economic implications. Uh, and so I think we need, we need to kind of step back and, uh, and say, well, what, what's our broader strategy here? Uh, I lived through the decision in the Obama administration to essentially tell the Europeans, don't get involved with AIIB. Uh, I think we actually made a mistake. I think we took, we had the wrong policy in that. What but is the AIIB? The, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, we basically said, we're not going to do this. We don't want you to do that. We woke up the next morning and the, the Germans and the British, you know, they were all citing the documents. Uh, and that was, a, that was a clear case where 
we said A and they did B. Uh, we, we, we shouldn't let that happen and it will happen unless we start talking about our broader China strategy. So the first is let's not find ourselves undercutting each other. Um, and then the second would be uh, what Hans was saying. And, and here, the, that's where I think coalitions of the willing and plug and play comes, comes in to, uh, to view here. That maybe we could find some way of getting a, a kind of uh, naval operation of some sort that wouldn't just be France showing up on its own. Uh, maybe we could, we could make this look more like a, uh, a multilateral statement. Uh, and then finally, I would say the, um, and here I'm, I, I guess I'm, uh, this is more of a throwing spaghetti at the wall, but I have a, a deep-seated suspicion that sometime in the not too distant future, the Russians are gonna wake up and realize that we're sort of a paper tiger when it comes to s the threats that Russia faces. And they're going to be messing around in Donbass and, and go, whoa, Chinese are cleaning our clock. Mm -hmm. We've just lost Central Asia. And at that point, I think NATO should be ready to take advantage of what, what I think at some point will be a Russian pivot that says, looking forward, our problem is not with the West. Our problem was with China. I hope that happens sooner rather than later. <laughs> that let makes two it, of us. <laughs> let me open it up. Uh, all I ask you is, you know, keep your, tell us who you are, your organization, keep your comment or your question brief. S sir. Thank you. My name is Yanni Zepos. I'm a former Greek ambassador to NATO and a member of the team of experts with the Secretary Albright when we were preparing the strategic concept. Now, uh, a lot was said today about Russia and China. And uh, I remember in those days, Secretary Albright made big efforts to have the, uh, talk a lot with the Russians and try and get them on board. And we had a lot of discussions and very funny moments, in fact, in Moscow, where they kept us outside working in a bus for hours because they weren't sure they wanted to talk to us. But apart from that, I wanted to add that, of course, if there's going to be a new strategic concept in two or three or more years, I think uh, we will, it should be right to try and involve this time China in a way, which we did try to do in those days as well, but the Chinese did not respond at all. It was a, a, an easy touch, not very complicated, but they didn't respond. And one more element that I want to bring in today is India. It was not heard at all, the participation and what NATO could or could not do with India. I think that in this concept of Russia, China, Asia, NATO, I think that at some stage India should be included in our talks because it's going to be an important player. It is an important player, but looking at the demographics, the fact that it's a democratic country, the only one with uh, such a large democracy in Asia, I think that NATO in the long run or even in the short run should have uh, India on its papers and open a dialogue with India as well as far as the future is concerned. Thank you. So NATO, India Council. Just one, uh, one comment to add on this, sir. Uh, the, um, the issue of the, of the nascent peace process in Afghanistan has actually proven to be an issue around which we, we have been able to bring together every one of the nations you've mentioned, Russia, mm -hmm. China, NATO talks uh, involved with them, informing them at this point, but to build an international consensus, and of course India is key to this. I know, but I think that India should be, be allowed to play, if she wants that, a larger role in the coming years. Mm -hmm. This is what I think, and there is place for her. Can you get past the, uh, right behind you, the gentleman in the pink tie, Harlan Ullman? Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. I wanted to follow on Charlie Chupkin's warning and Hans's elegant prescription for a strategic concept, because in many ways, it's the most decisive critique of NATO I've heard in a long time for all the things they're not doing. Uh, when Madeleine Albright chaired the Council of Experts and presented the report in NATO, I had asked her whether or not NATO was relevant or a relic. And I want to put this to you as a panel, because bearing on what Charlie said, you can envision certain scenarios with Brexit, S-400s to Turkey, if 
Mr. Trump decides to go to war in Iran, this is not Iraq. You can see NATO becoming moribund. I'm not suggesting it could become CETO or CENTO or METO. But I'd like you to think about, supposing the worst case happens and it's not going to be NATO at 100, we might want to be beginning to think about plan Bs. And I say that because if we are at an inflection point, and I think Charlie makes a really stunning point, the problem may be us here. And I don't see how we've got substantive plans for NATO or anybody else to take that on. And that, to me, seems to be the biggest imperative for some kind of a strategic concept, not for NATO, but for the United States. And I don't know where that's coming from. Charlie, you want to respond? Yeah, I'll take a, a, a first whack at it. Um, you know, we, we, we may not have hit rock bottom, let's put it that way. Uh, if war breaks out between the United States and Iran, <clears throat> it's not going to be good for the Atlantic relationship. I think it's conceivable that the United States could in the near future be sanctioning Turkey because of the S-400s, find itself sanctioning this, what's called, uh, in, uh, in, what's, the, what's, what's it called? Instex. This is the new financial vehicle that the Europeans have set up to trade with Iran. It's, apparently, it's going to be up and running in a matter of days, I guess. Uh, and we don't know. Uh, are, we gonna, are we gonna take steps to, to bring it down? Are we gonna start sanctioning European companies? What about Nord Stream? So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of um, stuff out there that could still happen. I guess I, guess I, I, I think that, that we're gonna weather this in part because when I ask myself, are the Europeans gonna walk away? Are they gonna get so upset with us that they tell the US troops in Germany to pack up and go home? I don't think so. Are we going to say the Europeans are undermining us in Iran, we're leaving Europe? I don't think so. And that's because we need them and they need us. So I guess I would say I, uh, at, at this point, I don't think we need plan B but maybe I'm being a little too optimistic. I share Charlie's concern about where things may go with regard to Iran. We talked about this at lunch. Uh, the United States is, um, um, I was going to say rushing to war. Um, that may not be quite right, but I think we are playing a very dangerous game the Europeans look at this and they believe it's the United States who have created, created this crisis by ending the nuclear agreement with Iran. Now the United States, we, we have the issue of our European allies trying to keep the agreement together. I hope that works, I don't think it will. But there are a number of other things that could have this entire crisis spin out of control. The United States is trying to get uh, our European allies to join a coalition to manage this. Many of our allies may not join that coalition. We're going to have a replay, perhaps, of the Iraq War. Um, so I don't worry much about the Europeans saying we're walking away. What I worry about is the United States saying, we've asked you to help us. This is a burden-sharing issue. Uh, we're going to, we're, we're in a conflict with Iran, and um, you're not with us. Therefore, the alliance isn't worth it. That gentleman back there with the tie and blue, and blue shirt. A lot of people with a tie here. I'm Maciej Popowski from the European Commission. A uh, comment wouldn't be a surprise on the EU-NATO uh, cooperation, because I think we're very short. Uh, we've, we've come a long way, and, and the two organizations, the same city, have grown together almost organically. When I compare it to my active Yes, in the Polish Foreign Service in 2004, 2005. And many, many examples, uh, joint exercises, common work on hybrid, also strategic communication, also smaller examples. I mean, last December I signed the first ever contract with NATO, uh, giving NATO a grant of 2 million euros to the Building Integrity Trust Fund. Uh, and there is, more, there is more to come. But what is important is this, uh, the change of mindset. The Europeans have realized that defense matters. And there have been many turning points. Uh, well, our own activities, those close to 30 missions, uh, civilian and military, 
they are non-kinetic, they may be small, but uh, operating in very different environments. Then there was the Ukraine crisis in 2014, it has certainly contributed. And I have to say, I mean, you may not be entirely convinced by this idea of European Defense Fund, but believe me, from the point of view of European institutions, it was a cultural revolution. The EU, for the first time ever, is going to spend real money on defense, on research and development and joint procurement. And some of our lawyers still can't believe it. So I, uh, I think we have fixed the mindset. Now it's time to fix the helicopters. Okay. Ma'am, white shirt. Yes, you. Thank you. I'm Karin Shuey with the Estonian American National Council, which is also a member of a larger coalition of nonprofits that represent diaspora communities from the Central and East European region. And we are interested in your thoughts on whether the recent vote by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe to reinstate Russia is going to have an impact on transatlantic relations, and if there are any avenues for the U.S. to push back on that decision. Not necessarily a focus on NATO, but Charlie, you want to take a shot at that? Uh, when I read read about it uh, in, in the last few days, I have to say it, it, it worried me because so far the United States and the EU have stayed pretty closely aligned on putting and keeping Russia in the penalty box uh, where it belongs until there is a, a, a resolution of, of what's happened in, in Ukraine. And my initial reaction was, uh-oh, the ball of wax is, is starting to melt uh, because this is just the toe under the door. And now that they're letting the Russians into the, to the council, then maybe they're going to start. You know. Now, the, the one counter argument to that is, is the one that w was reported in the one article I read about it, that, that the rationale for doing this was not to begin to let Russia out of the penalty box but to give Russian citizens access, recourse to, to the courts, which, you know, uh, I'll take that argument at, at face value. But I would say overall, I'm struck that the sanctions have not only stayed in place, but have tightened. Uh, when I left the White House on January 20th, uh, uh, and I, I knew, you know, what was happening on this side of the Atlantic, I knew that things in, in Europe were changing. I would have never guessed that in 2019 those sanctions would still be there. Uh, so, so far, so good. So far, the, the uh, community has held tight and stayed lashed together. You know, when I see an Estonian colleague or an Estonian American stand up, I immediately think of enlargement and, for me, the success of NATO enlargement. And one, thing, one issue that hasn't permeated our discussion is where does enlargement fit? in NATO's future in, in this context. I come from a perspective that it's been a success story and that countries that are yearning to be in, in NATO that remain outside it essentially are ending up as a zone of instability that are actually perpetuating some of Russia's worst ambitions. So this, this is an American issue. This is a European issue. This is an EU issue because EU enlargement has just been, has been just as important as, um, and reinforcing it as NATO enlargement. I'd be interested from, from the panel where do you see enlargement on, on the agenda for NATO's future in the coming years? Hans? Well, first of all, historically, I think enlargement has been an incredibly important uh, element in uh, NATO's uh, development. It, I remember visiting uh, the Eastern European countries right after the fall uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, these nations uh, were disconnected. They were in turmoil. They needed a, an anchor. They needed a perspective. Uh, and NATO and NATO enlargement over time gave them that perspective. I suspect if Estonia had not been uh, allowed to join the alliance, there would be Russian troops in Estonia right now. So I think this has been a, a healthy process. Where does it go in the future? Uh, I think we may be coming close to the end of the enlargement process. Uh, I can see three sets of countries uh, that still might be uh, um, interested uh, at some point. We've got Sweden and Finland, the neutrals. Uh, they would be in tomorrow uh, if they decided to do it. You've got uh, some countries in the Balkans. You've got Bosnia and Kosovo. They have technical problems and other problems. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to see them eventually in because I think it would help with Balkan security. Uh, and then you've got Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, this is the real problem, Ukraine and Georgia. There's no consensus within the alliance to do this. So until there is, we have to find other ways to enhance their security. But should we be pushing for that? Uh, I would, we push for it uh, uh, at a summit in 2008 and it blew up in our faces. That's, that's in my view, the reason that Putin went into Georgia. So you have to do it carefully. Charlie? I would uh, finish the, the enlargement into the Balkans because it's good for the Balkans. I would leave the door open to the neutrals and I would call it a day. Uh, <laughs> I, I would not go to Georgia and Ukraine for, for two main reasons. One is we're asking for trouble. Uh, Russia would justifiably be very uncomfortable. And two, we're, 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 we're taking on missions that are extremely difficult to fulfill. Right? We, we have kept our distance from, from the Ukraine conflict in part because Russia is a lot closer to Ukraine than we are. It has a big border with Ukraine. Do we really want to go to war with Russia over Ukraine? I don't think so. General, do you have a perspective on this as an operator who's worked uh, with the NATO allies, new and old? Sure. The, uh, well, the, uh, the, from a military dimension, I mean, you have frozen conflicts, essentially, in Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, aside from the political uh, issues you have associated with that, that would be very difficult. Having said that, uh, the Georgians are the largest non-NATO troop contributor to our mission in Afghanistan. And the Georgians have been steadfast supporters of the United States, uh, both in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and that should be acknowledged and valued. Um, now, how we go forward from there with, with, with the question of enlargement is, is, a, trickier, is a trickier question. Mm -hmm. and from, from your perspective, from the EU, what, what do you think? Well, there, there probably are. not qualified to talk about NATO enlargement, but it's true that for many of these countries, the Euro-Atlantic integration has sort of gone hand in hand. Um, I mean, in terms of EU enlargement, it's pretty clear that the Western Balkans um, have that perspective. Um, and Turkey had it. <laughs> it's still technically an, an accession country, but there are various criteria to be met. But it is very political. I mean, we saw that recently with the decision to postpone a decision on North Macedonia and Albania until the end of the year. So, I mean, political realities st step in, and when you're dealing with a lot of internal problems and issues such as Brexit, for example, it's difficult sometimes for, for the European Union to, to think in concrete terms about enlarging. Having said that, it has done so successfully in various ways, and it's been transformational for the, for the countries involved. So certainly the Commission view is that the Western Balkans should, um, should join once they fulfill the criteria. But on NATO, I'm not really gotcha. qualified. I just can't yeah. help but throw in my 10 cents. I mean, for me, I think part of the reason why we have Russian troops in Ukraine and, and Georgia is because of the West's ambiguity on its, <coughs> on, on its uh, response to their transatlantic aspirations. It's been a, a vacuum that has animated some of the worst dynamics, I think, in, in, in Russian policy. And yes, enlargement in those countries will be tough to manage in the, in the West relationship with Russia. But I think we're paying the price in our hesitation on this. I can take one more question in the back, uh, sir. Admiral Warren. Hi, Don Warren, old retired guy. Uh, only one year as an academic in Coolidge Hall, where Charlie used to hang out, and only 44 years as a practitioner. Um, so I have different perspectives. Excuse microphone right. on your right. Great. So let's get back to the Iran conversation for a second, if I may. I have two member nations that recently experienced some unpleasantness uh, doing exactly what Hans said, freedom of navigation in the Strait of Hormos. Um, Norway had a Norwegian flagged tanker attacked, uh, whatever you want to call it, in international waterways. And the United States had an intelligence drone shot down in international airspace. So the question I have is what are the implications, what are the roles, responsibilities, what are the actions, where should the alliance be headed since two member nations just experienced whatever you want to call it, unpleasantness, Article 5, whatever, in international water and airspace. 
any takers on that? Hans? I do think that keeping the Strait of Hormuz open is an international issue. Uh, it's important to the Europeans, it's important to the Asians, it's obviously important to those in the Gulf. Uh, and so I do see the potential there for some kind of a coalition, uh, naval coalition, to uh, keep those, that strafe open. Uh, you go back to um, Ronald Reagan, they, we had Operation Praying Mantis, you may recall. Very quick war, but it was enough to terminate uh, the Iranian uh, effort to, to block up uh, the uh, strait. Um, the concern is that it wouldn't be limited to that, and that concern develops because of the rhetoric uh, coming out of the out of the administration. So I think the Europeans, if we said, you know, we're going to contain this, uh, we just want you to help us keep open the strait, prevent the uh, the mining. Uh, there might be support for that, but it immediately uh, uh, puts them in a position where they might have to be there as these things escalate, because they they don't trust us. We come to the end of our of, of this panel, but I'm going to ask my panelists one quick question, and really keep it to literally one or two words. When you look forward to the alliance in the world that faces today. What is its most, what should be its top priority? What action does it most urgently need to take? And I'll, I'll start with Hans and work back to John. I would say two, maintaining its cohesion politically and Europe uh, building a capability that would really allow it to fight with us uh, in a significant way, not just where we are today. Darla? Um, well, we're in, focused a little bit on its core mission, but while recognizing the new threats and challenges, but that it needs to work with other partners in order to address those. Charlie? I would define alliance broadly to mean the, the Atlantic democracies, and uh, uh, I would say the top, the top mission is to recover our mojo. <laughs> uh, in, investing in our readiness. That costs money, it's got to be spent well. That's, that includes modernization, and it, it includes a, looking at the size of their armed forces uh, against our level of ambition, and, and maintaining the interoperability, the ability to operate together Great. militarily. Thank you very much. I, mean, I guess a big message from the panel is, is that as NATO thinks about its actions outward, it also has got, it needs to get its act to inside more effectively together and effective. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Terrific. Thank you so much, Ian. That was fantastic. Really appreciate uh, General Nicholson, Charlie, uh, uh, Darabal. Th thank you so much, Hans, for that terrific conversation. I'm really looking forward to our conclusion here. I think to, to frame and to close the conversation today as we, we honor the Alliance at 70, it's my honor to welcome one of the world's strongest supporters of our Alliance, a person a person who has more experience in shaping NATO's direction than perhaps any single individual, and someone who actually needs no introduction to this crowd, but I'll do so anyways, the, the 64th United States Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. I mentioned earlier, but when I was, before I was in Washington at grad school, my goal was to come work for this woman, and I had an opportunity when I joined the State Department under her leadership to be part of what I saw works in the U.S. government when there is leadership that brings vision, can match that to strategy, execute against policies that help deliver on that, and has a team to do so. And for me, it was such an honor to see the Secretary's leadership under Strobe Talbot, Mark Grossman, Ron Asmus, my boss, to see what could be achieved when there was clarity after difficult, tumultuous issues 
on opening NATO's door to the cause of freedom, to secure freedom, to forge a new partnership with Russia, and to stop aggression and violence in Europe and the Western Balkans to ensure that a vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace could be real. In 1997, Secretary Albright was named the first Secretary of State, the first female Secretary of State, and became at the time the highest ranking woman in the history of the US government. During her time as, Secret as Secretary of State, Secretary Albright reinforced America's alliances around the world and relentlessly advocated for democracy and human rights, all the while while promoting constructive American engagement with our friends and allies around the world. She oversaw the first post-Cold War enlargement of the NATO alliance to Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, helping to project peace and security to millions who had previously been behind the Iron Curtain. She led the alliance to, to an air campaign to prevent genocide in Kosovo. Her efforts to strengthen the alliance did not end when she left government. We've heard here how Secretary Albright was asked by NATO Secretary General Andres Fogh Rasmussen at the time to chair a group of experts focused on developing NATO's new strategic concept, adapting NATO to the decade ahead. A longtime foreign policy scholar, Secretary Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor in 2012. And if this weren't enough, Secretary Albright is also an acclaimed author, you need to read her latest book, and a professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She has been passionate about preparing the next generation of global leaders, and we are thankful for that. Here at the Council, as a member of the International Advisory Board of the Council, we've been fortunate to engage Secretary Albright in many areas of the work of the Council, from the Middle East Strategy Task Force to more recently our Declaration of Principles of Freedom, Prosperity, and Peace, aimed at preserving and advancing a rules-based, values-based order. So with that, to close our event, it's my great pleasure to welcome Secretary Madeleine Albright to the stage. Madam Secretary, thank you so much. Damon, thank you very, very much for that introduction. And, and I want to, to thank you for telling everybody who I am, uh, because not everybody always knows. Not long ago, I was coming back from China, and Chicago was the first port of entry. And I was there getting undressed for the security people. And I put my stuff on the conveyor belt. And the lady behind me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? And I said, well, I got them at the container store. And then as I'm going through the magnetometer, the TSA guard looks at me and he says, oh my God, it's you. Uh, he said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia. And if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're always welcome in Bosnia. And then he said, can we have our picture taken? And I said, sure. So I go back to get my stuff. The line gets all screwed up, and the lady of the screw top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for straightening that out. <laughs> um, I am, uh, want to give my thanks to the Atlantic Council and the NATO Defense College Foundation, both for organizing today's discussion and for inviting me to offer the concluding remarks. I think this was a terrific panel, really. Um, I appreciate having been able to listen to it and to agree with many, many of the aspects of it. Uh, in the past few months, it seems as though NATO has celebrated every anniversary in its history. A and I have to say that has kept me quite busy. For example, in March, I traveled to Warsaw, um, where we were celebrating, and I had the opportunity, actually, to give a speech in honor of my uh, former professor and boss and the father of our moderator, Zbigniew Brzezinski. So, um, and then I went to Prague uh, and was able to celebrate there. Throughout the trip, I stressed the importance of fidelity to NATO's founding principles and its alliance of democracies, and as a result, I was uh, treated, as I often am, especially in the Czech Republic, as some combination of a queen and an irritating older sister. So, <coughs> and the queen part was, I was sitting in the front row in Prague at the castle uh, at the celebration, and the person that had been the Minister of Defense at the time of the Czech Republic's succession literally came and knelt in front of me and kissed my hand. <laughs> 
The older sister part came because Prime Minister Babich couldn't even think of talking to me uh, and was generally rude. Um, President Zeman was going to give a speech uh, about bombing Belgrade, and then I told one of his people that the, if he did that, I would walk out. So he talked more about what we did or didn't do in Afghanistan. And President, Prime Minister Babich had just come back from the United States, having given, I think, the most inappropriate official present to President uh, Trump, which was a revolver. Uh, the Czechs are very good at making those. And then <coughs> on the barrel, it had the Czech national slogan in Czech, and, and it, but it was, truth shall prevail. I have never heard of a more inappropriate <laughs> official present. Uh, so just a few weeks later, <coughs> I watched as Secretary General Stoltenberg delivered that historic address to a joint session of Congress in honor of the Alliance's 70th birthday. And later that day, thanks to the Atlantic Council and its partners who organized the NATO Engages Conference, I got to perform at that anthem place, where, which is the most mod place now in Washington. So you might think that that was the end of the celebrations, but in fact, it was more of a midway point. Because in May, I went to the Truman Presidential Library in Independence, Missouri, for a meeting with, I have to say, my favorite group uh, of former foreign ministers. The official name of the uh, group is the Aspen Ministers Forum. Its unofficial name is Madeline and her exes. So <laughs> <laughs> we went there because uh, that is actually where I signed the accession of the Czech uh, Polish and Hungarian con countries to NATO on a table that Harry Truman had used. And so it was really a wonderful time and having a chance to celebrate. Then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I traveled with President Clinton and others to Pristina, Kosovo to commemorate 20 years since the end of NATO's successful air campaign. So I actually, along with others, took NATO to war. And General Wesley Clark was there also. He had been secure. We did reminisce a little bit ab on, about some of the um, chain of command in the United States because he and I were very good friends. He'd been my military advisor when I was at the UN, and he actually used to call me up. And the Secretary of Defense, Bill Cohen, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, uh, Shelton said, this is inappropriate, you should not be talking to the Secretary of State. And Wes said, I get to talk to every other country's foreign minister, why can't I talk to my own? Um, so uh, it's that this is just a preview of what I'm going to do in my remarks, which is tell you a little bit about some of the backstory of a lot of the things that this incredible panel had. Um, in, when we were in Pristina, after a large ceremony, we laid a wreath at the K-4 Memorial in honor of all the NATO personnel who contributed to peace and security of Kosovo. And I have to say uh, that it was truly a spectacular experience to walk through the streets of Pristina with thousands of people welcoming us uh, and um, standing on balconies and on rooftops, waving American flags and some other flags of the NATO members, and signs saying, thank you, NATO, thank you, USA. It truly was amazing. And then having the opportunity to do all that while walking hand in hand with President Clinton. It reaffirmed for me that our alliance did the right thing by acting in Kosovo, no matter what you hear on RT or in the New York Times from Tom Friedman and Michael Mandelbaum. Speaking of the Russians, I also have to say that my visits to Prague and Warsaw and the discussions at the Truman Library reinforced my strong conviction that we made the right decision by admitting qualified new members to NATO rather than leaving the vacuum in the heart of Europe for Russia. And I have to say, since Bignev Brzezinski had been my professor and my boss, I can't tell you how often I spoke to him that we should be doing it, and clearly your views also, Ian, have a lot to do with the incredible strength your father had on this particular subject. Now, I don't mean to sound defensive, but there do continue to be critics, and it is my modus operandi uh, I do go over decisions all the time to see if we made the right decision, and I really do believe we did make the right decision. I think one of the things that I think not enough people have been aware of is that we actually were very careful uh, about making sure that those that were coming in were prepared. And so one of the things that I did when I was ambassador at the UN in 94 
I was asked to go with General John Shalikashvili, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time, to go to the various countries to explain what our process was going to be. And so we first went to Warsaw, and Lech Wałęsa was not very happy with the message that they weren't going to get in right away. And so what happened was I started out by saying it's an accident of history that two of the members of the five of the principles committee of the U.S. decision-making process were born not very far from here, Shali in Poland and I in Prague. And then Shali said, and you know, you will be able to come to NATO headquarters and have a telephone and a filing cabinet. Uh, and we were persuading them all of that. And then we, we had to go to all the other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And we had to do it very quickly, and we were concerned that we would end up making a mistake about where we were. So we had decided that when we got off the plane, we would say, we're so glad to be in your country to meet your leader. Uh, <coughs> and Shali said as we were walking out, he said, you do AOH, accident of history, I'll do the filing cabinet. So um, that is, we did do all that. We ended up in Prague, um, and it really, we really had worked very hard in thinking about how the countries would come in. And the Partnership for Peace, the PFP process, continues to be kind of a stepping stone. Um, and it also, we also made very clear to everybody that NATO was not a charitable organization. You had to pay your way. Um, and it was a very interesting uh, aspect of it. Um, and it really, uh, all these uh, anniversaries have really given me a chance to think through the background. So uh, I have been around a long time. My hair is actually gray under the color, uh, and uh, like the president. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but I, I do have to say the following. <laughs> Can I make another remark? Uh, I had to, I just was at, at the University of Virginia. Actually, I've gotten used to working with Steve Hadley in a bipartisan way. And we were there doing a program um, on cooperation and bipartisanship. And so first question to me was, uh, President Trump has asked you to come in to consult with him. What would you say? So I thought, of, first of all, that it would be a surprise if he actually did that, but that I would begin the following way. You have asked me to come in to, uh, you, for you to consult with me, but first I'd like to consult with you. I am getting older and my hair is falling out, and I'd like to know how you do those comb-overs. <laughs> so I've had some fun. Uh, <laughs> let me just say the following thing. I did grow up in Eastern Europe. My father was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia, and I grew up with uh, watching what was going on with the salami tactics that the Russians were using throughout Eastern Europe to acquire uh, the, their, uh, <coughs> their uh, colonial empire. And what really did happen, the U.S. wasn't paying, I have to say, that much attention at the time. And it wasn't until the coup in Czechoslovakia in February 1948 that I think there really was a movement to begin NATO. And so I have always felt very close to the whole operation and studied how it worked. From then until the fall of the Berlin Wall, NATO defended freedom in the West while preserving hope in Europe's East. And as a daughter of Prague living in America, I had one foot on each side of that. Since the end of the Cold War, the alliance has remained open to qualified members, and it has responded to threats both inside and outside the North Atlantic region, and it has begun with other partners to counter global challenges, including proliferation, terrorism, and cyber attacks. I do think it's also very important to think about the fact of what were we doing with Russia. And I can assure you that as we were expanding NATO, we spent a lot of time talking to the Russians. I personally met with President Yeltsin, and I made clear that we were open to the fact that if Russia were in a position, they might ultimately become members. He said, you don't need NATO anymore because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. And I said, it is not against you. We signed the NATO-Russia Founding Act. We did all kinds of things to respect Russia and to make clear that this was not against them. And I think it's important to remember that. Uh, I think that um, we do have an awful lot more things to do, and I think that the panel really went through all of that. 
and I think that there have been still problems that are out there, but I do think that we need to remember the uh, advantages and the things that have happened, that in the Balkans there um, people were living in fear, ethnic cleansing was taking place. Not everything's been settled, but it's certainly better. Uh, we have tried very hard as we've expanded to make sure that the Baltics uh, are a part of it and that we're careful about what's going on um, in the northern seas. And Afghanistan, despite all, all of its problems, and you, General Nicholson, I was so honored when we, you came to my office and we talked about things that had to happen and for your service. Thank you. Um, but I do think that there are uh, things are moving uh, forward. The world is not perfect, but just imagine how much worse it would be without NATO. And I think that we need to understand the role it plays. I think that um, the various issues, and we talked, uh, I was thrilled to have you all talk about the new strategic concept, because part of the thing that was so interesting, and just some background stories on that, uh, the uh, NATO, the uh, leaders of various countries were meeting in Strasbourg, Kiel to celebrate the 60th anniversary of NATO. And General and Secretary Rasmussen was named as the new Secretary General. And what happened was that it was decided that there would be experts to advise him. And what happened was every country named an expert. You were named, I, I was named by the United States. And so what happened, Rasmussen then decided that out of the 28 countries of NATO at the time, only 12 would be experts, automatically irritating 16 countries. And then he asked me to chair it. Uh, <laughs> and I think it was one of the more difficult things that we had to do. Uh, we did a lot of consultations. I think very important, we spent a lot of time. And there were two things that really came up um, that were specifically complicated, and one was whether a cyber attack was an Article 5 attack. Uh, and what happened was, uh, it was difficult. Uh, it had what had happened in Estonia, frankly, and um, at that time, uh, it was decided that it was not, we were not prepared to say it was an Article 5 attack because it was very hard to find out the genesis of it. It was gonna be an Article 4 that it had to come and be discussed. But the other part really was what, about Russia, and you already mentioned, we went to Russia not to consult with them, but to really have a dialogue. We were very specific about not having it be a consultation. Um, and we get there, and it was rather peculiar, not just sitting in the bus, but one of the things, we went to the foreign ministry. Now, I know Sergei Lavrov very well because he was the ambassador to the UN at the same time I was. So. We know a lot about each other, and we had gotten very friendly, and he had known about my thing about wearing pins as signals. So I had on a pin that was actually a knot, and we're standing in the hall, and he said, what does your pin mean? And I said, it's a bond. So then we went and sat down in the shiny room for the discussion, and he said, I figured it out. It's James Bond. <laughs> And I said, no. And he said, well, then it's what you think about our pipelines. And I said, no, it is a symbol of friendship given to me by your predecessor, Igor Ivanov. But the meeting that we had when we finally got into the Kremlin um, was really um, peculiar, to say the least. But mostly, it was kind of the beginning of a discussion, I think, about what they were thinking about in terms of hybrid warfare, Gerasimov and a number of different aspects. And so they already were beginning to act as if everything we were doing was against them. And, and I think that we need to remember that we are not the provocateurs, they are the provocateurs. But I think it's worth kind of knowing uh, the stories uh, behind that. The other part about the strategic concept that I think is very interesting, what the issue was at that time that we were dealing with was that most of all the activities of NATO had been out of area. Um, there were the experiences from the Balkans and Afghanistan, and we started talking about what the role of NATO would be if there were going to be more and more operations out of area. We also talked about the fact that NATO had more partners than members. And so talking about, Charlie, as you were, you know, the Mediterranean and all that, that was part of what we had begun to figure out was what was going to be the relationship with the partners rather than the members. 
And so what it was, what to me was so uh, really important was we were dealing with what were the issues then, and I could go on at length about that, but the bottom line is everything has changed. And all of a sudden, we are now in area. Uh, NATO troops are in, a, in various places in, in Poland and um, guarding things. And I think it's an example of the importance of having flexibility in these institutions. The other part I have to say that we had a hard time, if I may say, with the European Union um, when we went to consult. Um, I, and I also remember spending an inordinate amount of time when I was secretary and talking, and in Europe, making clear that there should be no duplication. Uh, you remember Hans? <laughs> and uh, there was a real question about the identity issue um, of um, the European um, defense force, should there be one. So it's very different in terms of the kinds of things that you were talking about of uh, relationships now. And it was not a good meeting with the EU. And the reason was Turkey. Uh, otherwise, um, there was not a lot of difference in it. But very different approach, I think, now with the EU. And I was very interested in, in what you were saying about that. So I think there's a lesson that people and institutions at age 70 have to have a little refurbishing. Uh, and, I, and I think that we need to look at what the various issues are that NATO um, has to deal with. I do think that it's important, the 2% is important, but when I was on my various uh, anniversary trips, I said 2% is important, but 100% for democracy. Because if you read the NATO, the preamble of the Charter and Article 2, really does talk about the importance of democratic institutions, and I think we haven't stressed that enough. And when I talked with the Secretary General Stoltenberg, uh, he said, you know, we don't have an internal system that is good enough to deal with the democratic questions. Um, there is no kind of operational part to that, and I think that that's something that, that needs to be stressed. So I, I think there is a lot to do. Um, I think it's very important to central, to see the central aspect of, of NATO, uh, and that uh, it, it does need to, in fact, uh, have a way to refurbish itself in terms of what's happened, because the relationship with Russia and others is uh, uh, key, and I think that uh, the panel raised those issues very, very well, so I, I won't go through that again. Uh, what I do would like to kind of come back to is, and Damon, you mentioned the Declaration of Principles. Um, uh, I have a lot of fun with the Atlantic uh, Council, an awful lot of things, and the fact that this group decided that it might be worth looking at the Declaration of Principles, which really came out of the post-World uh, War II. And I decided, one thing I stated, because we were at the Munich Security Conference kind of unveiling it, that one should see it as a renewal of our vows, that it has some very basic concepts to it, um, and that it is the basic uh, aspect of the, of the alliance itself and of so many other things, and I do think that we need to think about what the refurbishing is. So um, I'm very pleased to have been here, to have heard this really great um, panel, and Damon, your initial remarks, and I do think NATO remains central, uh, we need to make sure that it works. We need to work with our allies and, our, and the fellow members and realize that some of the things that happen all over the world end up being linked. And we need to explain to our people, all our people, and especially to the United, we'll see what happens in the debate tonight, uh, <coughs> in terms of understanding that things that happen abroad come home to each of our countries. And the way to deal with them is through strong allies. Thank you very, very much.